Mm, great. Uh, hello, everyone. I think now we are online. Just let me uh, check as always that uh, we should be online. Yeah, I think at least at YouTube, we are there. And uh, uh, great. So I think let me also check Instagram as well. I think we should. Yes. So great. So I think we are online. Uh, hello, everyone. We are live. We are global. Uh, thanks to the technology. And uh, this week, I mean, or this session, uh, I'm very glad that we have uh, Professor Madhu Sudan of uh, Harvard. He was actually at MIT before, Microsoft, IBM. We talk about all of these things about Madhu. So the people talk about him a lot. Like he's a, a, like a, a famous computer scientist. He has uh, lots of awards. In particular, he had this Nevalina. I think it has been changed to Abacus now, the name. And we will talk about that even the change of name change and uh, also, I mean, some other things like Godel or Infosys, uh, uh, among others uh, that we mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think Hamming Medal as well. So, uh, so it is great to have him here. And so, let me start. I mean, by talking a little bit about the personal experience with Madhu. So, uh, the first thing. Uh, Actually, that uh, I think I took two of his classes when he was at MIT, uh, coding theory and uh, uh, complexity theory. And one thing that Madhu is a, a great, so let me just actually close this window as well. I think that is a little bit, uh, yeah. So I think the speed should be better now. Uh, great. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, so I took uh, two of his classes. And one of the things that I actually I can say, Madhu is great in uh, uh, like describing and giving intuition for very hard materials in a very simple language. And hopefully we will uh, see that and we will use that uh, very uh, important, uh, I mean, uh, capability that he has in this talk to talk about the complicated thing that he's doing and try to mention it like in simple word that the people understand. So that's, uh, I really enjoyed, I mean, he's giving very nice intuitions about like very complicated proof that you will get the whole proof out. The proof might be, I don't know, 100 pages, but when you talk with Madhu, you will get it there. There are a few people, but I think Madhu is one of the best in that uh, regard. And so that's uh, one thing. Yeah, I mean, I had a pleasure to work with him later, a few years ago, on some uh, papers as well. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, just some uh, personal things about uh, Madhu. So I think that was that would be great things to have him here. And uh, I think uh, we can uh, just uh, uh, start by. Uh, by the way, yeah, I think uh, he got his PhD in 1992, if I believe, uh, because I think I got his, uh, and he got also this ACM dissertation uh, award for his uh, PhD thesis. Uh, Another person that actually had it was Professor David Carger from MIT that we had it a few years, a few weeks ago, and uh, Madhu is the second person. And we will talk about uh, that thesis as well. He got his PhD with uh, Professor Umesh Vazirani from uh, Berkeley. And we also talk about advising uh, uh, approaches. That's the thing that we have started with Professor Carger. I think that's a good thing also to talk about this experience. Uh, also, we have added uh, this part about open problems. With, I mean, I have had in some of this, uh, my, the lives that we had, but we have it more formally here. We talk about some of the uh, important open problems. This, some of them might be technical, but uh, these are some of the things that later people can actually refer to the talks. We have referred to that in top CS theory conferences, actually, to the, uh, like, uh, this, uh, videos and the particular minute actually for the open problems. So we have that one and uh, we are live on uh, I think Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, you can ask questions uh, from at YouTube specifically, uh, LinkedIn, 
you can uh, also Instagram. If you can email me, that would be great. I mean, if you have something, especially if you are at Instagram, sometimes I may miss some of the comments. So you can just always email me at uh, my Gmail account. I will check that one. And uh, it would be great also if you can, uh, we try to maximize the, I mean, essentially audience by going to several media. At the same time, if you can, uh, I mean, subscribe at uh, my uh, YouTube but Haji Agai, that would be great because that's one of the things that in a standard way brings all the, uh, like this nice life, I will say, uh, with the very uh, uh, good people. And uh, it would be good because then you don't miss them. The others maybe not that uh, uh, specialized in this way. Okay, so uh, with, uh, without further ado, we will go to Madhu. And uh, do you want to start, say something, and then I will start ask questions and then we just start this okay great so, so thanks very much Mohammed. i'm really excited to be here i'm really impressed uh, at your ability to do this because uh, you know even though we work in computer science not all of us are very tech savvy and to be able to pull together a zoom uh, video chat so live stream it on five different media uh, mass media outlets is just quite amazing and impressive. So thanks for doing this. Congratulations on doing this successfully at, at others. And I'm hoping ours works well too. Yeah, so, uh, and, and one thing that I forgot mention, <laughs> to mention, that's actually uh, part of this, I mean, like a start of this, uh, like kind of live series, actually the credit goes to Matthew. I think he has done one of the great things a few years ago with Professor Shafi Goldbasser, who is the head of Simon's Institute. I think I really like to <laughs> talk that one. I think that's actually a good idea to talk. And we are talking, I think, a bit more about personal things here as well. That's one thing is more relaxed very as well. So uh, uh, great. Uh, OK, so I think uh, let's start. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, the way that we are discussing, we are talking about something about life, then we may make it some technical and vice versa, such that everyone can get some benefit. And, the people don't get bored. But let's start from your, uh, I mean, childhood. So when did you, uh, I mean, start, I mean, did you imagine that you want to be a scientist, of course, like a great scientist now? And uh, like, uh, how did you think about it when you there? Did you have any special thinking, math, computer science, etc.? Yeah, go ahead. So great, great question. So I, uh, what I remember of my childhood and growing up is, of course, yes, I did want to be a scientist of some form. Uh, I think really when you say scientist, my mental image of it was an inventor, somebody who invents great things and does things. Maybe like uh, early growing up early on, we sort of uh, already realized that, uh, uh, you know, fuel and uh, uh, um, getting sort of renewable energy is going to be something that's important for mankind in the future. And so my maybe mental image of that time was, you know, oh, if I could do it, then this is what I would want to do, build, you know, new ways of uh, harnessing energy, et cetera. Never uh, really thought beyond that as to how to connect it to actually what I know and what I, how I do it. Uh, what I was enjoying in uh, school was definitely mathematics and to the extent that, you know, physics involves mathematics, I would like physics as well. And this is, so I was doing well in math. I wanted to be a scientist and had no connection, no idea how these connected, but I had a feeling that they did. Uh, great. So any family, uh, any person in the family was professor, I mean, or teacher or that I think are so important. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I mean, uh, we've had lots of sort of teachers in my family, I think. My, uh, my father's elder brother was a teacher, my grandfather, who died well before I was born, was a teacher, etc. But uh, they were not close enough for them to be personal um, uh, impression, uh, you know, to create a personal impression. And these were really high school teachers or middle school or even yes. elementary school. The same uh, was for me, actually. Yeah, was. Exactly. So, so you probably know this feeling. I mean, when I came, uh, started to think about research or uh, to learn about advanced and higher education, more or less what I was learning from was from peers who were, you know, in my school, whose elder siblings might have gone off and do, done something and so on. And that was the most that I knew about uh, higher education and uh, academic research and all that. Yeah, I think for me, it was like <laughs> very similar in the sense that, I mean, I think no one was like in, uh, like 
universities or etc. But like my mom and father, both like in high school and like in middle school and elementary school. But they were all talking about like students and I mean grading etc. I think still we are I'm talking about that when I teach a course. So in that sense, actually, I had this concept of students, and I think that was a great thing for me. And I think you had similar people essentially, not at university level, but at the, like uh, high school or. I mean, I still, I mean, I wouldn't say I was that close to the teaching environment so much that I don't appreciate my love for students from the teachers that I have known, but just from personal experience. Uh, I can sort of, uh, the Indian culture was somewhat different and there, you know, students are usually treated as pests. And, you know, these are not people who, you know, help, but, you know, they're necessary evil. But, I see, I see. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, that's not everybody. And there were definitely teachers in my own experience from when I was teaching, some of them who really went out of their way to be nice to me. I remember a, a teacher in primary school who was so happy with the performance in an exam that she went out and bought a book for me and gave it to me, uh, which is like, you know, way beyond the uh, uh, people's means and abilities in those days. So it was like there were lots of special people for sure. But at the same time, I don't know that uh, the general impression that, oh, I should love teaching came from my own experiences. It just happened to uh, uh, end up that way. And most of my love for teaching came from uh, the time that I started uh, uh, doing higher education, maybe college, more likely PhD. And then. Mm, great. And do you want to share anything about I mean, your family? How many children do you have? I mean, one question is, I think probably lots of scientists they have, whether my children should go my path or they should go some other path, because somehow if you can influence them, whether you should do that or not, I think that's actually a question that I have it with my three children. I think I'm sure lots of other people have that. Uh, I have one uh, daughter who's uh, already in college and she's choosing her own path. So she's studying history, maybe international history. And, uh, um, you know, I, I do uh, would say that, you know, when they can talk to us and learn something from us, they should because uh, we have more time to give them um, and we can probably give in, in things that we know well, we can give them better explanations and better uh, uh, training. Um, but at the end, the path to be chosen is their own, right? So I I don't know that uh, it ever works, especially, I mean, uh, you know, this applies not only to my children, but also to my students and so on. You try to, t you know, give them sort of juicy, you know, tantalizing stories saying, look, if you go there, you could probably do X, Y, Z. And if you do this, you could do X, Y, Z. At the end, what they do is what, the, the probably best at doing and then that might be a path which is aligned with something you suggest and then it might be completely different so you can't really choose it for them you can you can provide them with lots of enticements yeah i think that is one of the hard uh, i mean problems in terms of thresholds because i think this is always they're working both ways if they have they can have some advantage if they want to go there i mean we have uh, actually lots of great computer scientists who, Parents were also great computer scientists. At the same time, I mean, I was always thinking that if like my parents wanted to maybe force me in some direction, maybe I didn't go essentially to higher education like a CS or other things. So in that sense, or like, like Olympiad or other stuff. So that is important actually to find the threshold. And this is not always easy to find it. I think that's for different people probably would be different. That's, that makes total sense to me, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, uh, good. So uh, one of the questions I think the people will be interested in, like I think Madhu, I mean, like lots of great achievements. So how many uh, like uh, hours per day are you working? Like uh, like in past, I think that for in the, when you were a PhD student and now, I mean, of course it maybe it changes over time, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think our work and lifestyle is, special in that uh, we don't really have an on off button which we turn on to do work and turn off to not do work. Yeah. So uh, it's conceivable that I'm working all the time. It's also completely uh, plausible explanation that I'm not working any of the time. So there are programmed kinds of works. You know, when you teach, you're actually working. When you prepare lectures, you're actually working. Yeah. When you're preparing a seminar, you're writing a paper, you are actually doing it. 
But the real work that goes on in our life is when we are thinking about research problems. And one of the sort of wonders of our field and our community is a research problem usually sits in our brain. I mean, it just sits in our, you know, I don't know if the, what the neuroscientists say is the capacity of our working memory, but it usually sits in that small, tiny amount of space. And then you think about it when you're on a walk, when you're cooking, when you're doing anything else, you're thinking about it. So um, it, the spectrum of how much you think about a problem varies a lot. Uh, I think that being said, compared to people that I have known, I tend to be on the side that works, that's more lazy and works less. Uh, and there are people who have more clear discipline ways of working and they're, they're often more effective. Um, but I do, I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not going to change my lifestyle because this is what I think works most productively for me. I mean, I think I am maximizing my output and my output is not usually defined as saying, name the problems today and solve them tomorrow. But after a month of working, you look back and you say, what did I learn? And if you can name five things that you learned, that's great. And you know, that's uh, uh, it, 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 they may not have been on your agenda of things that you wanted to learn in the beginning anyway, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, actually, I mean, that I think you mentioned the great things like when you do a research, I mean, that is different about teaching or other things. Like, I mean, that then there might be some clear border between non-working and working, but when you do research really, quite different things. Uh, and I think for me happened, I don't know, there probably happened for you as well. Lots of, I mean, nice theorems that I could prove actually happened when I went to sleep with that. And in the morning I came and I had some idea that finally, I mean, not exactly that idea, but I could work through the day and I could make some sense out of it. That happened several times for me in a sense that hopefully I think, or I don't know, I don't know, say hopefully, but probably brain work during night on those as well. Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, for different people, different things work very uh, nicely. Uh, there are times when I have tried to sort of crash my head against a wall and try to solve a problem and sometimes manage to resolve it that way. But uh, many times, I, for me, the most, uh, in fact, to me, uh, I uh, correlate walking with proving yes, theorems. Yeah, the walking actually helps a lot. Yeah. yeah, that's the one other thing that no one is around you. So uh, uh, great. And uh, so I think uh, we will uh, maybe ask this one upfront about uh, like when you, uh, because I think when you are uh, like a PhD student, then uh, lots of things is on you <laughs> to think about the problem because I think I will mention to my students that when they graduate a PhD student, they should be better than their advisor in that area because I think that's the definition of PhD in some sense that you are like some of the best and including your advisor. So uh, that's one way, but now then, uh, so that's more on you. Now you come and you become essential. You have lots of great, you already had lots of great uh, students. I mean, just Ryan O'Donnell, uh, Van Cott, uh, I think, uh, forgot. I mean, I don't want to mention the names to, uh, 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 I mean, so such that I miss some of this, but uh, yeah, so that's the thing that, uh, but you can see all of them uh, in math genealogy. I think that's the website that you can see all the things. And of course in your CV. And uh, for, uh, forgive me if I <laughs> forgot some particular name, but these are some of the names that just came to mind. So uh, what would be the style of, I mean, when you advising PhD students? Because then you may advise several students, I mean, at the same time, can you work with all of them on their problems or some problem you may like it more and I mean, what do you do in that case? I think that would be also a good. Okay, that's a great question. So, so there's two different things going on over here that are blend, blending. And there is a tendency in the world of research to blend these two. I try to at least separate them in my head, but in my life, it cannot be separated. What are the two issues? One is we want the students to do as well as they want to do. Two, we want the most clever people to be working on the problems that we want solved. So there is an agenda saying, I want to do research in this area. The more collaborators I can find, the better. Uh, there is this wonderful pool of uh, uh, you know, power, uh, intellectual power, that's your students, and we want them to do as well for themselves as they can. Sometimes it's actually good to merge the paths, saying, okay, look, you, know, you 
uh, and and I don't tell them look, you are good for working with me. You are not good for working with me. I never make those assertions. Some of them want to work with me. They're welcome to. Others hear about my problems and say, look, I try to find something else that's fine with me. Uh, either style of working is great. I mean, some wonderful people. I mean, Ryan O'Donnell and I don't think have a single paper together. Ben Rossman and I don't have a single paper together. Venkat Guruswami and I have like infinitely many papers together. So there's very different styles that work for different people. I, you know, um, if they like working on the problems that I have, that's great. Some of them work with me on my problems and go on to work on many other things of their own. So that's good uh, also. Um, but when I do want to set some time aside for my own agenda, this is research that I need to do. This is the only way that I will stay intellectually alive and thriving. And the more I, uh, I also think of my own research in large part as really learning, not doing. So I want to learn new things so that, and, and the proof of that is that I can also do some new things, but really the learning is the agenda number one for me. Uh, and if I'm learning more, that means the next batch of students come in has one more thing that they can you know, learn from me, if they, can, they can tap in from, uh, on from me. So I think that's very important. I do uh, work, uh, uh, you know, set time aside for that. I set time aside for students and say, look, you know, we want to make sure each one is doing well, but this amount is very uneven depending on how much the senior student needs me or in general needs advice. I and mean, then some of them are so good at, you know, mentoring themselves that after a little while, you just say, look, you know, you don't really need me, but anytime you want, you can find me here. And then they come and contact you at the frequency that they need. Uh, in fact, the way I mentally think of it uh, a PhD student is ready to graduate when they actually don't need you. <laughs> so like uh, when they don't, you know, when they're trying to avoid you and they say, "Oh, look, I don't want to be found by Madhu," that's probably means that they are ready to graduate. Uh, um, so um, you know, th th that's uh, uh, so you the amount of attention you give per student scales with their needs, and. Um, but then I don't conflate that with the amount of time that I might be spending with them because I'm spending with them on the problems that I am interested in. If it's problem time, that's separate than advising time. And, uh, and these two I keep separate. I don't, uh, in, so there may be some students with whom I'm spending a lot of time, even though they don't need it because they're actually working on the problems that I care about or, you know, uh, so, so, um, so that time uh, I keep, sort of, I, I count for it differently. Uh, yeah, so that, I think that's one thing that came to me, I want to get your opinion, that some students come and say, this is a problem that I want to work on it. And then the question is that, I mean, you feel like as an advisor, maybe you should also think about it. Uh, at the same time, maybe it's not, the, I mean, like, I mean, our life somehow is limited. We cannot think about all problems like in depth, essentially. So in that case, I mean, what would be the style that you are taking? At the same time, I mean, you feel bad if he's just, I mean, coming and reporting to you and you may not know some of the background, et cetera. So what would be the trade-off in that case? So I rarely uh, am able to jump into a problem with some that somebody gives me and says, here's how I would think about it or here's how I can solve it. You know, I'm not that good a problem solver that I can just pick a problem and do it. But occasionally when people come to me with a problem, I'm also, I mean, at the end, I think, at heart, we are also uh, people in our field of CS theory are, you know, puzzle solvers. We do like puzzles. If somebody says, "Here is a question," and you don't, can you guess the answer? I'm definitely going to think about it. If I understand the question, that think I should know the answer, then I really want to solve it. And so, so there will be occasional times when I will say, oh, look, I will try to think about it because you're, uh, because this is uh, uh, something that I should be able to do. Uh, but if it looks far from my line of expertise and I, uh, uh, I don't think I can come up with an instant uh, answer or can think about it for even half an hour and get an answer, I would just let them know that, look, you know, you're welcome to think about these problems, but uh, don't expect me to help because I'm, I'm not an expert in everything. Uh, and you're better off finding and seeking an expert and asking them for help if that's what you need. Uh, also, sometimes I would even express opinions which are, you know, 
not which are judgments which say, oh, I don't think this is something that's likely to see progress, etc. I can say that uh, sometimes I've been wrong and uh, very happy to be wrong in those ways. But uh, I think it's part of our job to tell the students what we estimate as a difficulty of a problem, because some of these can be wide open, has been, looks like other problems that have been open for 30 years. And if you don't tell them, then they may spend a lot of time and not make progress. Yeah, and I think uh, I want to add uh, something in a few things that you mentioned, they were great. One is that, I mean, like, you are working on theory. I think uh, this is like the, I think lots of, I mean, we are talking about matter, one of the best currently like in CS theory. And I, it's not the case that, I mean, when you ask a person, you expect that you will have the solution for you. I mean, that takes time essentially. And I will say that if the answer actually can be very easy and tell you, probably it's not worth doing the research because that's the thing is that it should be hard and then you, everyone should think about it because if like matter can solve it easily, so in some sense, maybe problem is not that deep essentially. Maybe some other people can solve it. So in some sense, it's good. And you should not expect that when you ask a question, I have some answer for that. At the same time, I think uh, this is one thing that, uh, and then I think that you were underestimating about the advising, like in the sense that, I mean, you, the way I'm sure that somebody asks you a question, you have so much great intuition that you can just add uh, to that and mention, I mean, the different, because I think, that, I think that's the part that I want to go about leading a research that if you may not do actively that problem, but you may lead a research. I think that's an important thing because you may just say this is this problem. Of course, I mean, you know, you don't know the exact solution, but you know what are the, who are the people who work in this area, for example. I will say that happens that, okay, if this person worked on it and couldn't improve the constant, don't, I mean, don't expect that you will at least, I mean, get the result soon because that would be probably a hard problem. But maybe, I mean, this person is like more intuitive. You may get some improved constant or several other things like this. Maybe this other problem is related to this. I think these are like more leading your research. And uh, yeah, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think we can sort of add context to the research saying that, look, you're looking at this question without telling them that necessarily you're going to run into a wall in a minute or two, you can say also, here is a related question that may be interesting. Here's another related question that may be interesting. And very often we find that, you know, you, you start heading in a given direction. Uh, like it also happened in uh, one of the joint works that uh, the two of us were involved in where the students were interested in a particular question came to me, but then they also started exploring lots of related questions and eventually progress was made in a different direction than we uh, uh, would have uh, anticipated initially. So I think um, uh, there's, as long as we are sort of learning important and useful things, it's good. And we have the experience of looking at questions from different perspectives from many over the years. And we can sort of say, oh, this might be relevant, this might be relevant. At the end, there's no promises saying, this is the one thing that's going to be relevant. If we knew that, then we would have the theorem and we would have the results. But uh, usually that's not the way things work. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, I think we can talk about it advising probably one more session. I think just one quick thing that also I think came just maybe we can then pass through this one. That I mean, like, for example, with different students, do we have like a particular time of the day that you will talk with them or you may call them essentially I mean, late night, I mean, not that late, but at night or evenings or something like this, or they may call you at that time. So I don't usually uh, uh, do phone calls or uh, things very well. So usually uh, when uh, when I'm in office, they're free to walk in whenever they can, uh, can and find me. But, uh, you know, the amount of time that we're spending in offices is also greatly reduced of late. Um, uh, I do make myself available on uh, forums like Slack. So if they want, they can always ask me a question. If I'm able to, I'll answer it on Slack or on email or depending on the nature of the uh, how, how long I think the answer needs to be remembered. Uh, we might occasionally, very few people have said, oh, I need a Zoom meeting today in the next hour. Can we do it? Uh, when they do, I mean, I, you know, I, if I can, I usually would do it, but uh, uh, it's not, it's not ever been uh, uh, asked for. My style is typically more like, oh, if we can, let's try to meet within, you know, three or four days is the, uh, is the typical uh, 
uh, window of time uh, that would be a quickly arranged meeting <laughs> from, by my standards. Uh, there have been times I remember when, you know, in the past when we were in physical offices and so on, where a student would come in and say, oh, look, I have this result. And I remember once uh, Sergey Khanin came in and he had this result, which sort of became his PhD thesis. Yeah. It was a big deal. And I normally, you know, almost fastidiously go home between five and six o'clock. And this time I just said, okay, look, why don't you come at the end of the day and we'll talk about it. And then I stayed on till about seven, seven thirty, And then, you know, he explained everything and we went back and forth many times and just to make sure I understood what was going on. And uh, it seemed to all make sense. So, um, uh, so, so, you know, if the result really demands it, you spend time then, uh, but if it doesn't, uh, and or it, you know, if you think it can wait, I just I tend to not stretch my workplace too much to no comment. Actually, I mean, Sergey, you mentioned actually. I, I think we were a student at, at the same time, so I know some part of, and we played actually ping pong together. Uh, so, <laughs> some that, so I know some from the other side. And especially, I think that his area was a bit, I mean, different from your main area. That, but he had done a great thesis, and I think he also got a ACM uh, dissertation award. I think, if I remember correctly, as well. That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, great. Uh, good. So uh, I think, uh, again, uh, to the audience, we are live, we are global. Please feel free to ask any question that you have it from Madhu. If you have time, we will ask him. I mean, hopefully we will ask him. And uh, like, especially YouTube uh, is good. Uh, LinkedIn is good. You can email me in Instagram. Also, you can put comments and just, yeah, email me if I miss your uh, question. Uh, that's great. Now, uh, let's go, uh, I think, uh, to the more... Uh, college time and the PhD time in the life one. We will go alternate between more professional versus personal life. Oh, but there is one question I think uh, maybe actually you want to answer. So Matthew Sudan, is, Sudan is really your last name or like, or I know that lots of people actually from India, I know them, their first name is Matthew Sudan. But is it the case for you as well and then change during the time? <laughs> Right, yeah. So, so actually, it's a good segue to uh, let me just say a quick hello to my family who uh, in India who may be watching my mother and my father and my sister. Um, uh, when I was named for some reason, uh, my mother and father chose uh, to name me Madhusudan. This is a single given name. Yes. Uh, it happens between. They also happen to spell it as in two parts. So there's a Madhu and then a space and then a Sudan. And when you are in India. It, this is fine. You always are asked to spell out your name as you would spell it out. And there's no uh, firm distinction between first names and last names, given names that were given by your parents and your uh, surname. Some people do not have last names, uh, which goes down within the family. I don't, for instance. And in my case, it just so happens that uh, um, they had the two parts. And when I started moving to the US and there was some sort of a need to have invent a last name. I just used the second part as a last name. And so, uh, which unfortunately lost me lots of uh, uh, priority in the alphabetical order and papers, but still you know, <laughs> it's consistent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think that is the interesting thing that we are actually, I think uh, uh, to just give a comment on that, that in theoretical computer science, I think they're very good habit that we are actually going alphabetical versus some other things that they discuss who should be the first author, who should be the second. And they always say that, I mean, if like an author is really helping you, then in the next paper you will be, be with him. If not, maybe you don't have the paper next with him. So that's like the way of, uh, yeah. Uh, great. So, okay. So uh, let's go to the college time. And when you were, uh, I mean, like, uh, I mean, you 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 uh, got your PhD from Berkeley, and I think you were in IITs uh, before that. So, how did you choose a computer science uh, versus just pure math, maybe? And then, I mean, what was your experience with Umesh? You want to say something to <laughs> Umesh? And I think he had also great several great students, so you can also add to that as well. Yeah. So, so uh, first, the choice of computer science. I mean, it was not really a choice. Uh, when you are in India and you are applying to, um, uh, you know, uh, from uh, high school and applying to colleges, uh, you are expected to pick a professional direction. It's either engineering or medical uh, sciences, uh, you know, to become a doctor. And 
you're expected to make that choice at uh, high school level. And once you, you know, why? Because really nothing else actually is considered, at least, you know, maybe the elites who are sort of already in academy, academia, et cetera, have a better sense of distinction. But if you're in the lower middle class and so on, you really don't know much about all these different fields. All you know is you want to get a good job. And then you ask around, okay, if you tell me that I should do engineering or sciences and I decide that I want to do engineering, what do you recommend further? And then somebody will just tell you, okay, these are, you know, computer science is 99% likely to get you a job, electrical engineering is 90% likely and mechanical engineering is 80% or something. And that's it, that determines the thing. This is a more or less linear ordering everybody chooses it and I was not particularly knowledgeable or savvy to do anything different I uh, and you know we didn't come from a family which had extensive background or experience in these uh, uh, things so we just went with the uh, uh, general societal wisdom which was computer science is what we should be doing um, I had uh, like I said earlier you know I wanted to be maybe a physicist if I'd known the phrase I was good at math uh, computer science was another point in the spectrum which was not connected to either of them, which were not connected to each other. It was only in the college days during IITs that I had started to get some sense of, you know, oh, how does math play a role in one of these fields? And I was fortunate, very fortunate that mathematics actually plays a strong role in aspects of computer science. I mean, maybe it's not so surprising. It does uh, play a role in almost all aspects of uh, engineering and the sciences, but still uh, it's a pretty dominant position, I think, uh, uh, in uh, uh, computer science and CS computer uh, and theoretical computer science. So that was fortunate. Uh, Berkeley is where I feel that I really sort of had my intellectual birth. I mean, till that time I was, you know, I was in an algorithm that was being programmed to run as fast as I could. Uh, I was not supposed to be thinking about my path. Uh, and I was doing well. I had very good mentors even in uh, uh, college days. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Sachin Maheshwari, who was a, a professor who sort of introduced us to theoretical computer science and uh, sort of found me, wrote me, hopefully, presumably strong letters, which uh, led to both the Vazirani's, Umesh Vazirani at Berkeley and Vijay Vazirani at Cornell somehow admitting me into uh, into their institutions, despite my somewhat lukewarm grades. And um, so uh, this was great, but, you know, I really wasn't, uh, I hadn't uh, realized what I wanted to do even uh, at the point of graduation. When I came to Berkeley, I still was sort of entertaining the possibility that I might not be just doing CS theory and maybe I could be doing other things. I had no experience and no uh, ability to actually do systems or build architectures and so on. I had none of that uh, uh, aptitude, but I didn't know that. Uh, in uh, uh, Berkeley is when not only did I realize what am I good at, what am, do I like, but also the general notion of inquest and the you know free exploration it took me a good two to three years before I found out. I was very fortunate to find Umesh Vazirani as, a, as an advisor. Uh, it's a challenge. He's one of the most liberated minds and, you know, he thinks very, very freely about all kinds of things. I had not any of that training and took some time to sort of synchronize up with him uh, to realize that, you know, if I'm not being told what to do for the next week or the next month or the next year, and Umesh was really very free and would never, ever say, do something, uh, uh, do this and do that. He would really want you to come up with the questions. Uh, it was challenging, uh, but at the same time, by the time I get, get got into my later years, uh, uh, the environment became much more, you know, uh, productive for me, and I could learn a lot from him. And uh, his eccentricities and quirks, which were like really amazing, you know, he's one of the sort of I, I really think of him as a very very deep thinker. And uh, even about every little uh, uh, thing, like, you know, how far parking spots should be uh, spaced across away from each other and things, you would have very deep and independent thoughts from the rest of uh, uh, rest of us to think about it more or less programmatically. So uh, it was 
amazing learning from him. Initially, I used to find it hard to find time with him. And then suddenly uh, things changed. And there was, I remember one time where, you know, my housemate who happened to be not a theoretical computer science, but working in industry engineering and operations research, um, came up with some idea and then the two of us were talking and we said we came up with what we thought was a new idea for linear programming and um, Umesh asked me what have we been up to lately and I just told him the story and it has you know we had no theorems no uh, concrete ideas and I remember spending like about three weeks in cafes with them trying to work out uh, with my uh, housemate trying to figure out how this might work it went nowhere, but it was like one of the most exhilarating periods of my life. You know, we were just discovering all kinds of new things in uh, in high dimensional geometry that we had never ever explored before. Uh, so it was really fun. I mean, you could just see that um, he didn't seem to think that he had any limits to his, um, you know, where he can exercise his intellect. And he didn't seem to think we should also have any limits as students on which directions we choose to explore. Uh, here's a person who should have been very concerned that I was wasting my time on doing something where I had no prior uh, experience and no prior knowledge. And there is an entire you know, uh, deep uh, line of research which has been exploring it. And he didn't seem to uh, be faced by that at all. He was very happy to be wasting his time and my time and uh, my roommate's uh, husband's time on something that, you know, very likely would go nowhere and actually went exactly nowhere. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. I mean, just, I mean, I just mentioned this is live, you know, there are children in the house. Sometimes <laughs> I may mute it. That's why it does not disturb the things. And also sometimes I been look at, I mean, the other system to make sure everything is working and no breakdown in life because I'm the technician in some sense as well. Uh, great. So uh, then uh, when did you start? I mean, your thesis got the <clears throat> ACM dissertation award. So when did you start? I think this you started that it didn't go nowhere. So how did you start the actual things that went? Everywhere? Actually, one of the things I'm very poor at predicting is which things will go somewhere and which ones are not. Um, so my um, uh, during graduate school, I happened to uh, um, start some collaborations with Ranit Rubenfeld, who was also a graduate student, who was a couple of years ahead of me. And uh, she had this uh, wonderful paper on the linearity testing, self-testing and correcting of programs, uh, where they invented this thing called the linearity test. It was a beautiful technical innovation. Uh, and um, it was it was a challenging thing. Many, many people, you know, it was very hard to convince people that this was an interesting new question. It was clear it was a new question, and most people thought that it was just coming up with a, uh, a boring old question phrased in some uh, jargon and uh, probably should not be explored much. It was very challenging to prove that not only was it relevant, but it also was uh, mathematically uh, uh, profoundly deep question. And uh, anyway, I started looking at this question I, uh, in the course of things. And you know, because I was enough interested in this, Renit introduced me to this question of low degree testing. So this is a, a thing where you're given, you can you have some function with many variables. You can ask for the value of the function at any point. And you're asking the question, is this some polynomial of some small degree or not? And um, and you want to ask the value of the function in very few places in order to answer this question. So um, accidentally, she said, okay, you know, roughly what they had done was we could answer the linearity test was the special case where this degree of the function was one. We wanted to extend it to higher degrees, seemed like a reasonable technical challenge. We worked on it for a few, um, uh, it took us a few months before we uh, were able to, you know, make progress on this question. Then we got a uh, sort of I can remember the key moment where we even got the uh, the idea. Ranit called me with an idea, and which seemed to go halfway. And then in that phone call, uh, I could somehow convince her that it actually went all the way. And so the, together we had this full uh, uh, proof. And but was she working with uh, Umesh as well? No, we were not. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I had no papers with Umesh while I was a graduate student with him. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, my only paper with him happened many, many years later. Uh, hey, no, I'm talking about Aaronic. She was. Uh, no, she was not working with Lume. She was a student of Manuel Blams. Oh, I think okay, yeah. So there is, uh, I don't know if people in this audience are familiar with Manuel Blum, but Manuel Blum is the father, of, pioneer, uh, father of modern cryptography and program checking, who also happens to be the academic uh, ancestor for I mean, about half of the people we know. Exactly. So, uh, so there's a huge number of people. Ronit was his advisee. Umesh Vazirani was also his advisee. Exactly. So I was his grand advisee in that sense. And uh, so we were all, you know, there was lots of collaborations amongst the students and they would go across all uh, advisors. Um, so Ranit and I started writing, uh, wrote this paper together. Uh, I was then, you know, in, even in an exam, I was asked, you know, okay, what do you think are your, your thesis is going to be on? And I mentioned some other problem. Uh, Dick Karp was on the examining committee. He said, oh, there's no way you're going to work on this problem in the future. And he was right. And then I said, okay, here's this other problem that I'm going to work on. And again, Karp sort of ruled it out and said, you know, I don't see you making progress on this. And he was right. I haven't made progress on that question to this date. And uh, there was a third problem. And I said, oh, you know, I'm working with Ronit. This is, you know, clearly a paper. It's going to be in the future. So he said, okay, maybe, okay. Um, and so I was cleared to pass the exam, but I really didn't think I would go anywhere further with this. And then suddenly in the last year of my uh, college, many things happened. We generalized what we were doing in this paper. We were uh, strengthening, uh, you know, I started to understand what parliaments could or could not do and started exploring new questions about them. And suddenly there was also this ongoing work on interactive proofs that somehow seemed to relate to polynomials. Uh, people were starting to look at hardness of approximations. Everything just came together. And then we had this one mega paper, which happened, uh, I can pretty much say, I mean, it's, it did not start before uh, SODA 1992, which was in January. SODA 1992 is where I saw Mihaly Sianakakis give a talk on the uh, on a new algorithm for maximum satisfiability. And I was trying to say, how does this, you know, why can't we prove hardness for this? And came up with some ideas independently. And uh, there was this ongoing work of Aurora and Safra, which somehow seemed to apply to this question. Our own work on low degree testing became relevant. Linearity test itself became relevant. And all of this came together in the course of one month and we had the result. And then uh, it took about, uh, so, so um, uh, you know, you spent five years of your PhD thinking, you know, about all these grand things, linear programming, data structure, lower bounds, uh, online algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. And then in one month, it, you know, you sort of realize, okay, your proof, your thesis is going to be on polynomials and hardness of approximation. <laughs> it's, it's really quite amazing how our field goes. And uh, uh, this is how that, particular thing happened, yeah. Uh, great, so I think you mentioned a few points that I wanted to just I mean, highlight them. So that might be actually useful for others who are listening. So this, I think this this is a story that I heard actually from, I mean, lots of people who got, I mean, great award. Like, I think I heard it from Maria Mirzakhani, actually. She got the first, the first woman that she got actually Fields Medal. I think this year we have the second one. We are very proud of that we have the, uh, second person, and I want to just say that Nevalina, that also uh, Madhu got it, also this is given the same things, and this is somehow called uh, Fields Medal in Theoretical Computer Science, they given every four years to one person. So, uh, and this was, I think, this was exactly the same thing because we were a student. She was two years before um, ahead of me, and I remember that the fourth year I asked her, okay, I, of course I knew uh, her from Iran. I said, oh, you have done always great. So when do we graduate? And he, she said, actually, I don't have that much result to graduate. And lots of this actually happened in the last year, and I think this happens also to several of my students. I mean, like you may have a linear progress, but not always the case. I mean, and sometimes actually, if you don't, I mean, I cannot say always that's better if you don't have the linear progress because linear progress somehow is more uh, like a, a lower risky type of things. But uh, surely there are, I mean, great people and they have done, I mean, like in a non-linear way, like the last year you got a result that this result is everything. And can essentially 
uh, I mean, give you lots of awards, I mean, prestigious jobs, etc. And but but I think the main thing is that uh, like it like that's I, I will say to my students that you should always work hard and don't become I mean disappointed. That's important. If you don't work hard, you don't get anywhere. But as long as you are learning, I think that's one that also you emphasize. Like learning part is important. At some point that it will come to you and then you will put everything together and you will just have one big result that work essentially instead of several other results that other people have obtained it. So that's one thing I wanted to I mean mention. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree that, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, we are constantly learning and expanding the powers of what we are able to do. But uh, mathematics, especially even theoretical computer science nowadays, have become deep fields. And so you have to learn a lot to be able to do better than the, uh, the previous, uh, you know, what's already out there. Uh, so uh, it is really definitely becoming, uh, you, you're starting to see this kind of a curve where for a while students are not proving new things and then suddenly they are, you know, proving all the new things. Uh, and it, it takes long. Uh, it, it, I think it's important to yeah, stress that this happens again and again so that students don't, don't get disappointed. You also would like to sort of, you know, have them think about, uh, you know, is there are some times when they will come up with thoughts independently, which uh, might have been discovered already before. Uh, and sometimes they tend to think of it as a bad thing that oh, we came up with this idea, but was already done before. I th try to reinforce that this is a good thing. It says that the next time you come up with a new idea, maybe it wouldn't have been done before. And then you would have the result. If you're capable of coming up with new ideas, it's, you know, uh, it, there is a lot of uh, other knowledge out there. So sometimes you might be rediscovering things, but that's not a bad thing. That's actually very good. Yeah, I, also, I mean, this is, I think, one thing that I will use. I mean, because generally it may happen that you, you think exactly as you mentioned, you may try to get something and then uh, under, you will understand that someone else has done that. I mean, say it is like getting the result is like building it, like I think multi-story building. So the good thing is that, I mean, you try to do that. Sometimes you are lucky, you will just go and linearly you will create that. But several times that happens that, I mean, you will go there and like I thought you want to get 10 minutes for the building, you will go five and you will find some result and everything collapse. But the important thing is that actually when it collapse, it does not totally collapse. It's still like you may have some progress if you get, I mean, things there. You know, you have actually done one or two <laughs> like a level progress and several a few of them may happen such that you will get this 10 uh, story essentially building up that's a great result that you have right yeah and as long as you are sort of mastering the material as if you are proving it even when you know you're reading the proofs of others there is hope there is hope that you will start doing new things very soon uh, it's only when you sort of take facts from other papers for completely for granted and just use them as black boxes, then uh, one starts to worry about it and say, oh, look, I want you to somehow sort of manipulate that proof, not just know that it exists. Uh, uh, great. Yeah. So that was one thing. The other thing that I wanted to actually mention, so I think Madhu will mention that, I mean, he's giving uh, lots of intuition, I think. So let me give one intuition here about the work that I think he, me he mentioned the work about the uh, uh, like with a uh, it. And I just want to add, I mean, this is the general way that you can think about it. So if you consider why this is applicable to everyone, essentially, who listen that, maybe not technical. So nowadays, this is the data world and data science world. And we have lots of data. All this machine learning are working on the data. And one issue is that this data that we have are huge. And the idea is that you want to get some meaningful information from this huge data by looking at a few places. And like, because like, if you want to spend, of course you can read it, I mean, the whole things, but then you need to pay nowadays, actually, even to read it, you need to do it, these cloud things to Amazon, uh, like Microsoft or Google or some other things. Like you need, you can read everything, but reading everything is costly, it takes time and also it costs. The whole idea is that we want to get some meaningful information from this big data by looking at the, a small places. I think that's somehow I can say 
I mean, you can add more to that, but a lot of work that you are doing, we call it a sketch or actually like some of this uh, PCP that we are talking about it. Lots of them uh, are coming from this understanding. And I think that has also rooted in coding. Uh, so uh, that's somehow the general idea that we are talking about. So if you don't know that much about the things, this is the whole idea. And here, of course, the idea is that we want to get like into like a deep dive into that. See, like whether this information that you will get is correct with some probability or see some chance or because you can randomly give some information but we want to do better than random i think that is something that we will talk more here and i think that's the way that i will consider essentially the world yeah so, so sounds great yeah so i think you're leading to areas like property testing and streaming and sketching which are areas which are looking at massive amounts of data and trying to come up with very quick uh, uh analysis and uh, uh understanding of it and um i think of sort of two very basic problems which are probably very familiar to people one was the problem that we see every time of an election is coming up polling the population to see you know, what fraction is going to vote for one candidate versus another. We don't run an entire election in order to figure out, estimate what's going to happen a month from now, because you know, that's expensive. We can, it's so expensive that we try to do it only once in two years or four years. Um, so, but we can sample random people and ask them, what are you going to vote for? And this gives us a very good sense of what the global population might end up doing it doesn't always work for reasons that people change their minds etc but that's uh, if you set that aside if you really were able to get the global information if you could sample the global information as it would be on the day of the election and get accurate samples then at least statistically this problem is solved but this is a kind of thing that you know it's remarkable it doesn't matter how large the population is you want to get an estimate you just have to ask a constant number of people, maybe, you know, 100 people, maybe 1000 people, doesn't matter if you're looking at billions of people who may be op opining on something. Um, that's an example of property testing. Another one that I think of, which we sort of, you know, which relates closely to this low degree testing and other such problems is you know, uh, what I call the Kepler problem or the Tycho Brahe problem. You know, people had data on the movement of the planets for longest of time, and we're trying to come up with a hypothesis which would explain what uh, what this is. So they know at any given moment of time, if you're standing at a particular point of Earth, on Earth, where exactly that planet is sitting. And they're tracking this information over time for many, many, uh, you know, for, for years they had this information. But based on this information, they were trying to figure out what is the, you know, space of all the things. There was even this notion that all these planets were moving in circular objects around the Earth. There was theories which said they were moving in circular objects around the sun. And then there was the correct thesis, which is that they're moving in elliptical orbits around the sun. If you look at these kinds of questions, is there, uh, you know, I have, I don't know the exact radius of each one of these planets and their movement. But I want to quickly answer the question, are they moving in uh, circular objects around the sun? Are they moving in um, uh, circular objects around uh, orbits around the earth? These are questions that you can formulate. These are roughly the analogs of property testing of you know, low degree polynomials. You convert this to algebra, there'll be some polynomial equations and you want to know are these, is there some polynomial that from the set of polynomials that you're thinking of, which would explain all the data. And uh, it, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense that if you could get very quick ways of analyzing it, it would be useful. And it hasn't been till the modern era of computer science that we've realized that, yes, all of these questions can actually see very, very fast algorithms for it. And yes, they have been very useful in this PCP technology, which we might probably touch upon later. But they have also, I mean, I think they have general natural appeal. Fitting polynomials to data is something that many, many, many uh, fields of analysis do. I mean, physics might do this and uh, in many forms of engineering and so on, you might want to do this, chemistry, you might want to do this. Uh, and um, we have very rapid ways of analyzing this data and seeing, you know, will the polynomials fit and explain or will, is there no point looking here, look elsewhere. 
<clears throat> great. Yeah, I think uh, this idea that uh, we are, uh, this actually, if you work in Python, even there is actually, so in some sense, this is kind of regression, in, I mean, some version of regression. And even in Python, actually, this is one that is very useful. If you want, you can just write and have a polynomial that goes to a set of points. You will say the degree and define it. So it's very like a basic problem. And that's, I think, the whole idea of, I mean, like work that um, Madhu has done is on the people in theoretical computer science are doing. Of course, I mean, the people are using it, but like somehow the current thing that you are using, I mean, that, as I mentioned, that function, for example, uh, that currently is in Python or several other things. Some of them actually based on some of these theories that, I mean, the people think over time and then go little by little each time they improve it. And at the end you may use it and like maybe the simple things, but at the end actually like some people have spent time on doing that. And so that's the thing that we will go. So that's the whole idea that we try to see these points. We try to understand the shape of these points in some sense. Uh, great. So I think uh, uh, we can go now, I think, uh, to talk about like uh, your thesis, because we had some kind of essentially introduction about efficient uh, uh, checking of polynomials and proofs and the hardness of approximation problem. So if we talk about the hardness of approximation, we can talk about it. I mean, uh, Madhu uh, uh, got actually the uh, ATM doctoral dissertation award for this, Godel Prize, this, uh, Nevalina Prize, and a few other things. So that was that was one of the main like the part of the work and also some coding that we are talking about. So yeah, go ahead and <clears throat> please, I mean, talk about them. Great. So so maybe, yeah, I mean, the, the thesis had these many components. Uh, the most important one uh, for uh, us to probably uh, understand is the hardness of approximations part. And maybe I'll start with that. Exactly. That's the great thing. Um, we, um, you know, one of the most powerful use of data is so that we can optimize with it. We can run data and solve many, many optimization problems very quickly on them. Uh, but we would like to understand how well we can solve them uh, theoretically. Uh, when can I expect an algorithm to be able to zip through something and compute an answer and when can it not? Let me give two examples of optimization problems that we might want to solve. I have say um, the database of all the um, you know, costs of airplane travel from point A to point B on earth. And I would like to find out what's the cheapest flight I can find to go from here to some point, let's say my hometown in uh, the south of Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, it's, um, um, I want to find the cheapest price. Well, this is something that I can just, plug into a, a computer and find the price most efficiently. And in fact, we have lots of software which does it. You know, Every one of these travel agents is basically running this kind of software. This is what's called the shortest path problem. I know how long it will, I, I don't have a direct flight, but I might have to combine many different flights, but I know how to find the sequence of flights which will minimize the total amount of cost going from point A to point B. Now, a second objective that I might want to have is I want to visit a lot of different places. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> um, sorry about that. So uh, a second problem is when I want to visit many different places, I don't have a particular objective. Maybe I'm really what this is what's called the traveling salesperson problem because they want to visit a bunch of places where they want to do business but they don't have a particular order in which they want to visit them. In fact, let's choose an order which will minimize the total travel cost. Okay, For any given pair of places, we know what is the cheapest way to fly from A to B because this is something we just solved. And now we want to know what is the total, how do you minimize the total cost of this entire travel? But maybe I want to go to A first and then B and then C, or maybe I go to B first and then A and then C, or maybe to go to C first and then A and then B, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many possibilities. And as the number of places grows, the number of possible things that I might want to explore explodes exponentially. It's called N factorial, if you've seen this. And numbers like 10 factorial can already look, you know, imposingly challenging. And we would like to know, is there a better way of finding the shortest trip than exploring all the possible orderings of these things and then finding the cheapest trip, which will follow that order. <clears throat> and 
to this date, we haven't found a normal fast polynomial time algorithm. We have better exponential algorithms, or sometimes we have things which don't work very well, but these are called approximation algorithms. So since we cannot find the shortest, the cheapest trip, we might say, look, okay, if it's going to take you a long time to figure out what the cheapest trip is, and maybe it'll take you an year to find out what's the shortest trip next month, well, that's not very useful. What can you tell me in a day or in an hour or in 10 minutes? So maybe I can give you a path and I can give you some sort of a guarantee saying, look, you know, this is going to cost you $700, but there is no other way of traveling to all these destinations, which will cost you less than $500. And if you want me to optimize the difference between 700 and 500, I can do it, but it'll take me a week or it might take me a month or it might take me a year. You can look at this data and say, well, can I try to use it? And certainly 700 versus 500, it doesn't sound terrible. Um, maybe even 7,000 versus 5,000, same, same ratio, doesn't sound too bad. You say, okay, look, I have to spend a lot of money. I can try to optimize, but it's going to take either me a lot of time or, you know, in the meanwhile, I have other things that I'm losing out on, hotel prices, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't I go for a slightly weak solution? That's called an approximate solution. It's still promised to be good. The cheapest might be 5,000. We don't know if it's there, but we are paying $7,000. That's, uh, in the worst case, it's 40% more, but maybe it's not. These kinds of solutions are completely acceptable in cases where this exponential search for the optimum is not uh, avoidable. This is what we would like to find. And till the 1990s, we really had very little understanding of how it worked. I mean, we had very good understanding of how to find the optimal solution and when is it really going to be very hard and no fast algorithm will exist. But finding approximate solutions, we completely had no clue about it. And one of these remarkable uh, things that happened in my thesis, along with uh, other accompanying work, my thesis was itself jointly written with many other authors. And then there were many other papers that contributed to this theory, the theory of PCPs, was we were finally able to show that for many problems, finding really good approximate solutions is actually as hard as finding the exact optimum. So exact optimum it seems very hard. Even approximate solutions can be as hard. And depending on the nature of the problem, sometimes these approximations are very good. I mean, they rule out really weak approximations and other times it shows something slightly tighter as hard. For traveling salesmen, I think it's like something like one person getting a solution, which is only one person away from the optimum is uh, hard, but maybe 10% is possible. We don't know how to do it. And maybe, uh, you know, but definitely 50% and even a little bit better than 50% uh, is doable by now. <laughs> Great. And PCP stands for? Ah, PCP stands for probabilistically checkable proofs. So maybe this also uh, uh, deserves some uh, description uh, and so on. It's a very intriguing concept. Now, I I'll try to connect this uh, hardness of approximations and PCPs later, but for now, we're only going to focus on what is this PCP object. Now, everybody has, who has seen proofs in geometry or algebra from their high school days uh, knows that there is this the proof is a very intricate uh, in a delicate object. You can, uh, there are lots of proofs on the uh, web you can search for that will prove one equals two. And if you look at this proof, which says one equals two, there'll be a whole sequence of equalities and they're all good, except there's one line in there, which is actually not good, okay? If you're allowed to e insert one erroneous line inside your proof, then I can prove anything you want, okay? It's not hard to do that because one piece of error can actually completely screw up proofs. So the, the general understanding of mathematics and logic has been proofs are very delicate objects. You really have to look at every line and make sure it is correct and being applied correctly given how it's supposed to be applied, etc. Never make any mistakes. And if you ever detect a mistake, of course, the proof is wrong. It doesn't mean that what you're trying to prove is wrong. It just means what you proved 
there is not the, the proof of the statement that you want. You should have a question mark associated with the statement that is being proved and a big X on the proof itself. On the other hand, uh, you know, we don't have, you know, people submit proofs of various things. There are things called the Riemann hypothesis. And if you, uh, it has a million dollar price tag associated with it saying, if you solve this problem, you can get a million dollars. And there are lots of people who end up thinking they have proofs of the statement. These proofs can often tend to be extremely long in the CS communities, the P versus NP statement and so on. There are proofs that will be like 100 pages and they'll say, oh, look, here's a 100 page proof. Uh, and now it's up to me to find the error. In the standard method of proving things, as we've said, it's a very delicate thing. Somebody has to read all the 100 pages and make sure every sentence is correct. And we know we will find an error because at the end, we don't think there is an idea, but it will take 100 pages of reading to find that error. And 100 pages of reading a mathematical text is much, much more expensive than reading 100 pages of a novel. So these things are not written to be friendly. So what we came up with in this, uh, this our field has come up with is an alternate way of writing proofs. These proofs don't look like the ones that we are used to, but you know, just because they don't look like the ones that you're used to doesn't mean that they're not valid. In fact, these are valid proof ways of writing proofs. In fact, you can write them as efficiently as you could write the old proofs, almost. Slightly longer, slightly more time consuming to write, but almost as good as the original. The real hard work is always in coming up with the proof, not in the writing of the proof. And now this format will be such that if the statement that you're trying to prove is not true, nothing you write will be error free it will be abundantly error prone so every you know 20 statements will or you don't you know you shouldn't be looking at a proof line by line ever because that would just say i i'll just you know up to this point i was proving one thing and now i'm proving something completely different uh, you should you should really be checking different parts of the proof to see if they are consistent with each other and this one is one where you can say, okay, look, I look at this part of the proof and this part of the proof and this part of the proof and see if they're consistent and three parts. And by part, I mean a single bit actually in each one of these places. I can look at three bits and read these three bits. And if the proof is, was written correctly, no problem. We will say it's fine. If it was written, uh, if you wrote, if the theorem itself was wrong, should have had no proof that would prove it, then these three bits will actually have an error with probability one half. Okay. But this is what is this probability over? It's not over what you wrote, it's not over the theorem, it's over what we choose to check. I choose to check and I'll toss a coin, just like when we were doing sampling of people to find out who, how they're going to vote. I should sample people randomly. I should not look at always go to the same person, always ask Muhammad, who are you going to vote for? Similarly, in a proof, you should pick a random location in the proof to start with, and then pick some other locations that will be related to it, and try to see if these are consistent. And there is a way, we will tell you how to check this, and in such a way that a correctly written proof would never fail, and an incorrectly written proof would fail with probability one half, even after you've just read three bits of this proof. And this three and this one half and all, don't depend on what is the statement you were proving, how long it was, how long the purported proof is, none of that. It just depends on, uh, I mean, this is, these are universal constants. So this is what is called a PCP. If we had thought about it, even in the 1980s, we would have, probably said this kind of an object is impossible to exist, but research initially in cryptography, then uh, transferring into program checking, and finally uh, in, in complexity theory, brought us to the point where we were able to prove that these things exist. And uh, that is itself quite a remarkable thing. Um, that's my story about PCPs. I'll probably take questions from Ahmed before I go on to explaining the connection to harness of approximation. Uh, muted. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, uh, so that's the thing that I mentioned, and like that, I think if Matt just mentioned, like put it very nicely, I think, <laughs> complicated thinking to something that the people can 
get it hopefully. So let me add a little bit even more to that. I mean, a few things that you mentioned and these are uh, from the, I mean, the real world. So uh, I think uh, I saw actually uh, a few discussion about NUDIP. So this type of thing that you mentioned, checking this proof actually takes a lot of time. So this is the issue that nowadays we have in this AI conferences or ML conferences like NUDIPs or triple AI. They have something around 10,000 submissions. And interestingly, the people also, I mean, they know that if they want to get the paper in, they should have some theorem because that increased the chance of eventually the paper gets accepted. There was a discussion one person actually mentioned, I will be happy if I see a paper and most of the proof is looks good to me. And I was actually about thinking that what's the meaning about what's of the proof? I think that was exactly the point that Madhu mentioned. If you allow to just have one line, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, 10 characters of wrong things in a proof, then you can prove anything almost that you want. And everything else is logical, except this particular thing that you will bring it and do that. Just think about P is equal to MP. Just this fact can actually help you a lot to get lots of things that we don't know. It might be the case at least we don't know, we don't have any proof or this proof for that. So that's important, and that was actually interesting. So somebody also this also it is interesting in this conference, like this NUDIPS. Actually, I like it. So everything is online. So even the reviewer comments nowadays is are, are using open review. The comments that the reviewer put it, the answer that you will put it, or I think the again the comments that David put it. Everything is online. The people can track everything. And it was interesting that I think one paper got the best paper award in or like some version of that in ICML or NUDIPS, and the people were complaining there are some big issues in that paper. How come this got actually the best paper award? And again, this because everything is uh, like on the uh, open, they can see. Otherwise, of course, they couldn't see that. But uh, that's an interesting thing. So this concept of proof being correct is very important. And that's, I think, is very important. What, what, uh, and like checking it is important. And this is, again, that's the thing that we do in like maybe in theoretical computer science in general. We go dive deep into this, try to get some model. Uh, and like the whole thing, it makes sense. But to answer this question, you really need to go dive deep. And again, little by little, you make, make something that later can be used for the real world. Another interesting thing about hard to self approximation, I think Madhu mentioned about the traveling sales person or uh, like uh, that was one important things. But actually I have created, I mean, some of this uh, software, for example, I just talk about more modern way of, I mean, maybe you want to essentially create something like in Kubernetes. This is some kind of cloud computing that the people are using over several cloud. And, or like this is nowadays the MPC, I think uh, that we had some of the work started actually with Madhu on that, about uh, this massively parallel computation. And <laughs> the idea here is this one, that always, I mean, you might, I think I mentioned that you may, you might be able to get the solution, but it is first, it can be very timely. It means that like you are searching something at Google and you may get, the, you want to get the exact things, maybe tomorrow you will come and get the answer. This is unacceptable for anyone. Even nowadays, if you click and you don't get it, that is unacceptable. And this is actually very important things. So nowadays, especially because of this online nature, this, I will say, approximation became much, much more important. The people really want that when they click, they see the answer. A little bit of delay is completely unacceptable, and the people will not be happy with any software like that, essentially. So in that sense, the approximation actually becomes very important because we have essentially the important uh, measure of time, and somehow related to that, the number of rounds that if you are doing, for example, a spark or others, that's the thing that the number of rounds that is computers essentially talk with each other. So and when I try to create an algorithm, for example, I mean, something that it is very important that this website answers very fast. And one thing that it might be actually looks ridiculous, I can give you, I mean, say that this consider big tech like Microsoft and LinkedIn. We were two people, I'm two friends near to each other. He sent me an invite for uh, LinkedIn. Interestingly, it took something like 10 to 20 minutes that I get that one. So that you will see exactly that approximation of how important, because that seems ridiculous. I mean, if you send it right now, I should get it like maybe in a few seconds. The fact that this, I don't get it, 
that means that there are some algorithms there that maybe not the most efficient, or maybe there is no efficient way of doing that. So that's exactly the way I think that uh, Madhu is talking about that sometimes, I mean, we can, but it, it is interesting. So like this happens, for example, at LinkedIn, it takes 10, 20 minutes that I get the invite that my friend near me and send it to me. It is important whether there is some inefficiency in the system that I designed, like LinkedIn, I mean, by Microsoft, as like one of the biggest cloud uh, service providers in the world. Is this because of that, because of inefficiency, or maybe it is not possible with this number of people or with the current cost or the time that we have it? So that's exactly the deep dive question that I think Madhu is talking about it, that this approximation that we want to get in a certain amount of time nowadays, maybe in milliseconds, it should be, can be done or not? Maybe Microsoft say, okay, I cannot do it, but sorry. I have a proof that it cannot be done. That is different because otherwise other... The people, if I look at it, I say maybe this is some inefficiency in the system. Maybe their server is not written correctly or like the back end or something can be improved. And that would be bad, of course, for companies like Microsoft that this happens there. So that's very important. But if they come with a proof, say that not only we didn't do that, nobody has done it. Or under some conditions, if you want to solve it, then some big problem should be solved, then we can have it. That's the concept of, I think, approximation algorithm, that especially with online uh, Algorithm that becomes much, much more important in the past 10, 12 years. So yeah, just want to add something on that one, essentially make it any comments on that if you want or Yeah, no, nothing. I mean, just, yeah, there, there's two resources that you're talking about. One, how much time are we going to, uh, are we willing to wait for an answer? And that's usually very, very firm. And, you know, like you're saying, if it's a search and you're doing a click, then you really expect to see the answer more or less before our own reaction time. And, uh, and so given that you have very firm time bounds and how much time you have to process the data and produce an answer, everybody has to give up this thing saying, oh, I could have found a much better sort of set of uh, responses to your answer if I was given 10 minutes, but I'm not given 10 minutes. So in one millisecond, what's the you know, best response I can give to your search query? Uh, that would be uh, maybe not, uh, sorry, uh, what I can tell you in one millisecond might not be the best response, but it should be a pretty good response. Maybe like if you measured in this case, you know, there were 20 different sites that were really important uh, to your query and should have been listed in your top 20. Uh, you can have a measure of approximation that says, I return to you 20 things what's the size of the intersection? That's a measure of approximation. So you can now say, okay, look, if I got all 20, that's a great response. But even if I got 10 of these sites, then I'm probably pretty happy with this. Uh, exactly. So that's, I think uh, you mentioned that one uh, correctly. And then one thing that is also, uh, I think it is important that, I mean, we may talk about one nanosecond, maybe like, I don't know, 20 years ago, we talk about one computer, how long it takes, I mean, maybe a day or something. But interestingly, this. Maybe, I mean, this one second of current time is actually means maybe much more time than that time. First, the computers are much faster. And the other thing is that in this one second, lots of parallel things happen. Like maybe, I don't know, 100 computers are working to give you this answer. So in a sense, it's still a lot of computation. And with this computation, we want to get the best answer. Maybe, I mean, if we can show that we cannot give the best answer, at least we can give you a close answer. And the question is that how close that with that? I mean, that answer to your actual search that you are doing, for example, at Google. I think that's the thing that we are going there. So, okay. So we talk about this, uh, essentially, this concept of uh, PCP and hardness. And as I said, we want to connect them more now. And then... Sure, go. sounds great. Yeah. I think one thing that uh, uh, the, the story of the connection has to say is, you know, something that has been built into this uh, the foundations of computing uh, from the time of Turing going on forwards, there is always this thing that computers are fundamentally connected to proofs in mathematics. Even the kind of, I mean, proofs of the kind, I mean, like a lot of things that we want to, you know, when we talk about proofs in day-to-day -day life or even in math papers, it's not, we're not religiously counting on the correctness of a proof. If somebody makes a spelling mistake, we kind of discount it, we know it. Uh, so we don't really uh, 
and like you say, even you know papers which have you know ten theorems are good, and eleventh theorem was wrong. We consider it totally fine. Uh, we will ask them to strike out the errors, but you know might still accept the rest of it. Uh, in um, <clears throat> but the the very under fundamental underlying notion of what is a proof actually leads to the question of what is a computer, and this is how Turing came up with this idea. This is how our theory of P versus NP and NP completeness got developed. And now it, a third in the third phase, we also connected it to approximations. Um, what's this connection? It says that, uh, you know, what is a proof? Proof is something that I want to write down. You know, there is a theorem, I write down the statement, and then proof is something that I want to write down. Nobody a priori tells you what it should have, but after I read the proof, I should be convinced that the statement is true. Now, why did we ask somebody to write this thing down? Why didn't we just try to figure out what we should write down in order to convince ourselves later? Because figuring out what to write there might be might take a lot of time. You have to try a lot of possible things that you might want to put in this space. And after a lot of thought, you realize, oh, this I thought about where it's not relevant, that I thought about it's not relevant. This one thing is definitely relevant, let me put that down. This is relevant, let me put it down. You find the right sequence of statements and you put it down. So finding the proof is hard mentally, but verifying the proof afterwards should not be as hard. Again, you shouldn't go through the whole process of, oh, I could, why didn't you write that? Why didn't you write that? I should just written, look at what's written and be able to determine mechanically almost automatically. So verifying the proof, easy. Finding the proof hard. This is a basic, natural, intuitive concept. But who tells us what is easy, what is hard? Is what is easy for you the same as what is easy for me? Is what is hard for you the same as what is hard for me? Um, and on this, philosophers and others have had debates over the years. And around the turn of the uh, 20th century, around the beginning of the 20th century, people started to get a handle on this question and they were developing a theory, Gödel and Church and others were all involved in this uh, uh, research and Turing somehow nailed the definition down. He said, you know, okay, I'll tell you what is easy or hard. In particular, I will design this machine. We call it a Turing machine now. He probably did not call it a Turing machine, but it's a machine. A machine, Turing machine is a computer in modern language. And a proof is something that should be quick to verify on this computer, on this Turing machine. A theorem, we make no promises that it will be quick to find. We think it may be hard to find, but we don't make any promises about it. But the fact that the proof is something that is quickly verified by this machine is what distinguishes proofs from just the statement of the fact. So this notion that a proof should be easy and easiness is captured by a definition of a computer is how a computer came into being in the beginning of our field. It was not designed to solve actual optimization tasks. It was inspired by other computers that Turing was looking at in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, break the German encryption system and so on, but the, the object itself and the specific fact that there is a computer you can design a single computer today, which can be programmed to solve other tasks later. This notion of a universal computer, a completely programmable computer came from this challenge of understanding what is a proof. Because you might say, I verify the proofs differently. You verify proofs differently. Why should what is easy for you be the same as easy for me? You'd say, no, no, the Turing, universal Turing machine will show that all of these things could have been done almost as if uh, fast and effectively. So it doesn't really matter which, of, which one of us is thinking about it. All of us should find all proofs easy to find. And there exists theorems which will be hard for all of us to prove, even though if there's uh, short proofs. Okay. So proofs 
And to define what's a proof, we needed to have an idea of what is a computer, what does it mean to manage data and analyze it and to understand if the sequence of bits that you've written down, calling it a proof, somehow proves this theorem. And this is how things were initially. Computers were designed to define the notion of what is an easy verification task, an easy mental process. Later in the 70s and so on, we started realizing that actually this task of finding a proof is probably about as hard as any of these optimization problems that we are trying to solve. I give you a big graph and I want you to find me a clique of a clique as a subset of people who are all talking to each other, who are all connected on the Facebook uh, network maybe, or you know, find me a set of people who none of, no pair of which will ever talk to each other. This may be useful in scheduling. If, if get, getting, you know, doing all of these tasks together might involve some conflicts, then you don't want to do any pair which is conflicts. Or find me a way of partitioning the set, you know, call these the red ones, the blue ones, and the green ones, so that there is no coloring, no um, adjacent things, no two people who are talking to each other within the same color class. All kinds of these problems are have the same phenomenon. If I can find a way to solve the problem, I can convince you very easily. I can prove it to you. Here's this map is colorable with three colors. How can I prove it? I'll you know, look at this region, I'll color it red. This is green, so on. You can verify. I never put two green regions next to each other. I never put two red regions next to each other. Verifying is easy. Finding that way of coloring it might have been hard. Uh, find me a subset of people who are all talking to each other and they have at least, you know, find me a subset of at least 1,000 people who are all talking to each other. If somebody tells you, here is the names of the people, then look, every pair of them had a, uh, a ch chat message within the last 24 hours. You can verify that. Um, <clears throat> find me that set might take lots of, you know, exponential time. So there are all these problems which have this exponential search associated with the task of finding, but easiness when it comes to verifying that a solution provided is correct. All of these tasks are similar to the task of finding a proof. Proof is also in the same arena of a mathematical theorem. I want to find the sequence of statements which put together imply the begin original statement, but each one all pairs are consistent with each other. And in the 70s, we realized that not only are these similar, but theorem proving is the hardest of the problems over here. This is the first NP-completeness problem, NP-complete problem. And all the other problems, if you could solve the theorem proving by some automated machine, then you could solve all these other problems by an automated machine. And that was the theory of NP-completeness. Move forward another 20 years, now you have a notion of a probabilistically checkable proof. What is this? We are giving you formats in which you write proofs. If the theorem is true, then there is always a correct proof. If the theorem is false, nothing will be, uh, will convince a verifier who's reading these things. You know, somebody who's trying to verify the proof and reads only three bits will not even be convinced with probability 60%. 50% is the largest that they will actually accept it. So you can ask the question, how? Well, can you solve the following optimization problem? Find me a proof which the verifier will accept with maximum probability. Well, if the theorem was true, there is a proof that is accepted with probability 100%. If it is not true, then there's one, nothing will be accepted with probability more than 50%. And uh, the fact that we are saying this kind of proof systems exist for all proofs says that approximating this uh, verifiers acceptance probability, you know, distinguishing between whether it can be 100% or 50% is actually very hard, as hard as saying, is there a proof in the original system or not? So when we go back to this intuition that this is the hardest optimization problem, it's saying that this new problem is even hard to approximate. It's you coming up with a proof which will convince the verifier with only 70% probability is as hard as finding one which the verifier will accept with 100% probability. 
So this is where we were able to sort of go from approximate solutions, only accepting with 70% probability, to solid proofs, which are always accepted with 100% probability. And this translation now can be worked backwards into many optimization problems. You want to find a thousand people who are all connected to each other? Well, even finding 500 will be ridiculously hard. If you could find 500, you can find a thousand. If you want to find a coloring with three colors, well, try to color it with 20 colors, even that will be as hard. So these kinds of statements are statements that somehow follow, sometimes easily and sometimes with a lot of work, from the statement that if you have a proof which, you know, can you find me a proof which can be accepted with little better than 50% probability? Well, that's as hard as finding it a proof that will be accepted with probability one. And you may want to, I mean, just say briefly, I mean, for the more technical audience, that what is the relation of, I mean, these polynomials and the proof? How do you use that? Maybe just a few in the like, good intuition that you always give you. Okay, good. So maybe we'll come back to this question. If we talk about uh, coding theory, we'll yeah, come back, we'll get a chance point. to come back to this question. Uh, there is a connection, and I will uh, tell you uh, where it relates to how you can use polynomials to express information. And uh, there's abilities that these polynomials provide. And we will see that in simpler contexts. Uh, and then maybe this, this is the sort of perhaps the more complicated context in which you can apply that. Uh, yes, good. So I mean, to just give some uh, summary of the things, essentially, we talk about approximation algorithm, very important, like even more important nowadays because of the online nature of the problems. And then the question is that sometimes we want to get the answer sometimes, I mean, because of inefficiency of our algorithm, we cannot get it sometimes because there is no way that we can do it unless we maybe make essentially a supercomputer, a quantum computer or something like this, that we don't have it yet. So that's important that we understand this one. That needs deep dive essentially. And that was the whole concept of PCP that we can, of course, we, I think Madhu mentioned about the MP completeness, MP completeness that was essentially asking whether verifying the proof and like in polynomial time or limited time is the same as obtaining the proof essentially at the same time. We don't know whether they are equivalent. I mean, some people believe that maybe they are equivalent. We don't know that. And then here, but that is the issue that, I mean, can we get this one or we cannot get a uh, this one or like verify it. But here the question is that, okay, based on this condition, so we are somehow making some conditional thing. So that assuming that we, uh, finding the proof is harder than verifying the proof, then maybe for this problem, actually we cannot get better approximation than this in a given time. That's the whole idea of, I mean, that is a nice theory of uh, PCP that, the people are thinking and giving this, and nowadays for lots of problems we have it. We have some limitations, there still there are wide open problems here. And of course, again, because we dive deep into <laughs> particular things, and it's not <laughs> um, enough for us that most of the proof is correct. We really need all of the proof to be correct. That takes time. Even checking that actually takes much more time. And so that's the thing that we discussed about uh, this area, and this is a great work of uh, that, I mean, Madhu with quarters have done. Now let's uh, do, I mean, uh, some break going something about, uh, I mean, some more <laughs> life, then we will come to the next part of that. That is the coding. I think that's uh, one important thing and very related to this. So, uh, yeah, so I think you have been in uh, like a different, uh, you got it, uh, I mean, first IIT, then Berkeley, then uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, went to IBM, then you came to MIT, then you went to Microsoft and now at Harvard. So this is a path that you took it actually both in, at industry and at uh, uh, academia. Uh, but the first question, have you applied to MIT the, the year that you applied to Berkeley? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember the answer. Uh, it's quite possible that I did apply and did not get in, but it's, uh, I don't recall the answer at the moment. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. Like I think we were talking with uh, Professor David Carger before that. He mentioned that also he applied the ECS at MIT. He couldn't get it. Then he got from Matt and also from Stanford that Knus actually sent him a letter that said, welcome to Stanford and he joined there. But I think like Eric Demain is another example that 
I mean, later they become professor at MIT. But at the time, they get admission, maybe I mean, uh, get it from the East. That's actually interesting about uh, MIT. But uh, uh, but uh, that was uh, some part of I mean the interesting part. But yeah, so you took this path essentially from I mean academia to industry again to academia then industry and i'm sure i mean that like when you came to mit that was the big thing so you decided to go to microsoft so i think that lots of people may not want to know what was the way of thinking about that sounds great so so uh okay the two things that i really want to do i mean one i want to uh do research as freely as i can uh, with very little pressures from other uh, things. And at the same time, I mean, uh, I, I, I very much enjoy the, uh, the education and interaction with students. So uh, whether it's PhD students and uh, mentoring them or whether it's teaching uh, in courses in terms of the material that you want to teach. Now, teaching can be, you know, there is a lot of administrative overhead to teaching, just managing large classes and so on, which are, not as fun, <clears throat> but, you know, they're just part of the uh, what needs to be done. We do it, but uh, it's not something that you look forward to uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but definitely the interactions, the uh, ability to sort of, you know, take a student who didn't know X and then teach them X and sort of see their eyes light up. That's great. That's something that we definitely would care about. So these are two things that I care about. And... Uh, Initially, when I was applying, uh, after my PhD, when I was applying for positions, I had some university options and some industrial options. I was very nervous at that stage. And uh, the nervousness came from the fact that it should have been a very steep climb from saying, from this, up until this point, I was able to seek advice of other people, and get it from them. Next month, I'm going to be flipping roles and suddenly becoming an advisor potentially to students and have to give them advice. Seems like a very sharp transition. I didn't want to uh, enjoy the idea. Nowadays, postdoctoral positions are uh, pretty strongly baked into our um, uh, academic path and that's great. But in those days, it was not so common. And also being an international student in the US, you want to sort of move from the position of being a student on a visa to you know something more permanent quickly and i just felt a permanent position would be uh, much uh, better but a uh, permanent position at the university is probably not uh, something i was ready for so that explained the move to ibm uh, from that point on it was basically trying to find out how i could get closer to uh, the you know research wise things were going fine maybe not optimally, and IBM was in the period from 1992 to 1997, which I was, when I was at IBM, it was one of the low points for IBM in terms of sort of, uh, you know, free exploration uh, and so on. So it was not uh, the best of times and um, things have been better before and after. But anyway, at that time I was seeking to go out, but also, you know, there was almost no, chance of doing the education and you know interaction with students. So I definitely sought something else when MIT uh, serves on the market again and you know amongst the places I uh, had options, I uh, opted going for MIT, uh, which worked out great for me. I and mean, then I really, really enjoyed my stay there. Um, the, the next two moves, both Microsoft and to Harvard were somehow uh, Maybe not <clears throat> very necessary, but it turned out to be good opportunities and somehow uh, worked out in the right way. Uh, going to Microsoft was, uh, you know, after a while uh, uh, of many, many years of being at uh, MIT, I felt uh, I was um, spending a lot of time chasing grants and so on. I wanted to have this ability not to... Uh, have to worry about any of that or as it turned out I was worrying about it only 50% of the time which is much easier you know giving 50% in grants is a lot easier than 100% uh, of your uh, thing. Uh, I went to uh, Microsoft because I could reduce my workload but at the same time Microsoft was giving me the opportunity to be an adjunct faculty at MIT. MIT was also sort of uh, willing uh, and I did. 
So I was continuing to teach one every, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while. And uh, if for people who don't know, Microsoft and MIT are really very, very, very close to each other. Uh, this particular lab in, of Microsoft is a five minute walk from my old computer science building. So, you know, you just, it was equally good to be here or there, but Microsoft was giving me a lot more freedom, go pursue things. I also learned a lot I didn't expect it, but I learned a lot about uh, you know mentoring while I was at Microsoft. I, had, I saw a lot of interns that would come to me. They were very, very strong students because they're students that have already been doing their PhD for a few years somewhere. And these are, we have by now enough information to pick from the top set of these students and you know get them to come. But then they're only gonna be there for with you for 12 exactly. weeks. So you have to find some really, uh, very different class of questions to ask them. And it uh, it somehow changed my research style a little bit to say up until this point, I was completely ignoring the easy questions that would could be solved in 12 weeks. But uh, now I started asking them and that they led to, you know, questions that, you know, I asked them over the course of the 12 weeks, they may have answered, some of them did not, but the interactions continued and then went into much deeper ones later. So it was a very good mode of interaction. Finally, coming back from Microsoft to uh, uh, academia was necessitated by uh, an incident at Microsoft where they decided to shut down a research lab without really good uh, reasoning or rationale behind it. And uh, they shut down one of their most promising research labs, yeah. one of the ones that was most uh, <clears throat> effective for the company and its products and uh, at the same time was doing absolutely top class academic style research. All of this put together and they just decided to shut it down on you know more or less a technical grounds. <coughs> this brought into question you know uh, how should industrial research really be conducted and I don't think industry has found a good compelling answer for it. So I feel right now the safe, uh, 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 the only place where you can really be happy doing what you're doing is uh, either being at uh, a university where you can be sure you can keep doing what you're doing and <coughs> you will have a position forever or being in uh, industry and knowing that anytime you are want to or are forced to, you can find a job in some other place. If you are in that category of uh, positions, uh, of, uh, then it's great. <coughs> For many people at Microsoft Research who were let go, they didn't really have this option of, I could find an equivalent place uh, within the three weeks that Microsoft was giving them to, uh, to terminate their employment. They could have easily found positions within an year, which is the normal academic time scale, but, uh, three weeks is not the right time frame. And somehow the fact that Microsoft chose to do it this way uh, shows contempt for the uh, uh, cul culture, shows ignorance at least for the culture, if not contempt. Uh, great. Yeah, and actually I think that uh, you mentioned some uh, important fact. I think this uh, fact that uh, Microsoft actually closed one of these important research center, as you mentioned, probably that's because I have been in that research center. And I would say that probably is the closest in terms of bringing research and industry together. And that's in that sense, that's like one of the main hub that they uh, closed it. So that happens in uh, like uh, industry. And also, I mean, I think that's a whole, I mean, industry, I think helped a lot. Like for example, in terms of like Bell Lab research or like IBM uh, later Microsoft research. And I mean, nowadays there are other like a Google research or I mean, I think probably, or there is Facebook, but they are not as like the same model that was like, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, because there are lots of fundamental things that have done, for example, at Dell Labs or even Microsoft, like the earliest day. I think because of this incident that you mentioned, lots of people like, I mean, several senior people actually left uh, Microsoft. There are some good people that still are there, but uh, that's interesting one. And I think I have, I mean, experienced this one also because I went to like at and then um, back to, Maryland, and then I mean, I was post like at CMU, and I mean, I have done a few things with Google, Microsoft, and others. And actually, this point that you mentioned is like 
very important for me. Like uh, when I go to industry, generally this happens. Uh, I mean, to me that like, especially the places, it, it is interesting. You will learn a lot. I mean, lots of this, for example, about the NPC on like a cloud or something. I learned, for example, at Google or at Amazon. But at the same time, the fact that, I mean, there are, I mean, bosses that is quite different there comparing to academia because that's a different, I mean, things. And you might be lucky. I was lucky, for example, I had a, 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 like a David Johnson as my uh, manager at ATID. That was great, actually. I learned a lot from him. But, you know, you may go to some other place, like at Amazon, like every few weeks they have some reorg. And you don't know, the person is coming and become your boss that I mean, you really, that person should not be your boss. And it, it's like, they were asking, I think some of this, that maybe you should not talk about this because the other VP does not like. And again, these are some of the things that it, industry, some of them are don't know good or bad for industry. Some of them, of course, there's more freedom of, I mean, speech is very important that can help a lot for industry that we have it at academia, but not at industry. And but whenever I go there, I think I will miss the academy. Of course, maybe in terms of money or this, in, nowadays industry especially becomes very good. I mean, maybe not except the past year that it's like went down. But uh, generally I think that's the difference between industry and academia. So that's like, the, you have more freedom, maybe less money, but you have more freedom. And you can talk about the thing that you like, and I mean, they cannot at least easily fire you if. Yeah, I mean, I think industries are constantly changing their uh, system of, you know, both the, the hierarchies, the, the structures of who controls whom, uh, the control structures within the company, and even modes of, you know, employment. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I know in one extreme, we might soon start hiring researchers like we hire Uber. You know, for one ride today, if we hire somebody, you know, here's a paper and I want to prove it. And, you know, people can bid on whether they want to join me and try to prove this and this is the money you'll get for proving a theorem. Um, I, I can just see that industry is willing to test all the variables uh, over here and alter them. Uh, and some are, you know, I mean, maybe these are interesting experiments, but uh, uh, for the kind of research that I, I want to do and many others want to do, I think you would prefer to have everything else kept constant and at bay so that you can focus on the questions that are most interesting to you. And even pressures which say, oh, don't try to prove, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't in investigate this question, investigate that instead. This may be more useful in some context. We don't want to see that pressure. It could be coming up from us internally, but not externally. So um, the it's very important, I think, to give researchers their uh, full spectrum. I think Microsoft Research, in the days when I was when I moved there and I asked them about it, they had this very clear mantra that we hire researchers according to what they can do for us, what we think they can do for us but we never tell them what to do for us. We already have measured it if this, you know. And so in my case, for instance, they had looked at my profile and realized that, you know, I will not be actually building products or developing intellectual property for, for them, but I would probably be, you know, a good member of the community who can sort of translate between the question that A is asking to a question that B would understand. And so be a good part of the, you know, the fluidity of, research culture and be able to translate results from one side to the other. So I would be a valuable citizen without actually proving, you know, without being able to document it with patents and products. And so then when I was there, nobody ever told me, oh, you know, we are looking at these questions, would you want to do it? There was the only time when they, uh, when something like this happened was when I said, oh, look, actually people in Silicon Valley are using a reflecting coast to do X, Y, Z. Maybe I should try to you know, talk to them and see what else. Uh, so it came from within me, but there was never external pressure. Um, <clears throat> that's the mode of research that I think is likely to be very successful given our natural strengths, our training and the nature of research. You would want to let people explore because they're curious, 
and according to measures that they have formed on their own, of, you know, value system that they formed on their own. If this is useful for you, then you should hire this person. If it's not going to be useful for you, then you should not hire this person. It doesn't make any sense to hire a carpenter and say, I want you to plumb my building. With a researcher, the variables have a lot more uh, thing. You just, you can only hire them and say, do whatever you want, because that's all they've been trained to do, do whatever they want. And great. Actually, that was one question that came. I mean, that I think like, maybe we can just briefly answer that one related to this, this one. So, like, so have you ever, I mean, like thought about, I mean, to be a leader essentially in, like, say, for example, industry or like academia, maybe go up. And if it is the case, for example, somebody asks, okay, was it, maybe you have been there uh, in, in these uh, top companies and top universities, we want to create in, a big, a nice research center is this company X. So what would be the ideal thing? I mean, do you accept such a things? And if you accept it, what would be a good measure that it is good somehow for the company and also for the people are there? Uh, any clues on that? Um, so to be honest, I mean, I have never accepted, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think leadership comes with a lot of responsibilities that I'm probably not ready for. Uh, so I would probably just say no to most of these things. I'm very happy. I mean, you know, we in academia and academic uh, should be appreciative of people who are willing to spend time in uh, administration, especially the, the, the academics that we respect for their academic work. I mean, these are the people that we would really want to have in, um, in our uh, serious administrative positions people exactly. have Completely very, very active value active. system and ability to measure what's good and what's not because if not then we are left with we've outsourced the important the most important task and then you don't know what kind of controls come back from people who don't understand the, the business so 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 i mean this i think is very important uh so if i could i would but i don't think i'm so good at it i I've, I've often served on, you know, hiring committees and uh, promotion committees and so on. And I've seen people around me who, how much of knowledge and contextual knowledge and uh, uh, wisdom they bring in. It's just not my style of expertise. I mean, I don't usually know a lot about uh, ongoing research, about <clears throat> the unsaid things, the, the tacit assumptions behind many, many uh, lines of work. So it's much harder for me to uh, play a role there. And I don't want to invest my time and energy doing that either. I think it would be a waste of resources of mine and possibly bad for the... Uh, no, I'm sure that I mean, actually you can do the great thing. But I think that's exactly the point that you mentioned. I think in, uh, I mean, like in academia, it's very important that the people, I mean, very great at research, these people actually go to administration. Because if like uh, the other people, they want to go to be boss there, I think that's one of the worst things. Because they are not going, essentially, they're not going, I mean, to improve the quality of maybe the department or the D or like the school, they mainly want to essentially promote their own career. That's not good. I mean, but the person is like great man. You, for example, in research, I mean, this person does not need this administrative thing to advance his career. His career is already the ultimate uh, thing that can be there. And these people, I think that actually can help the department much more. I think that's the thing that I will uh, actually encourage anyone who is good at research to take these things. It's a lot of work. I mean, it may decrease, I mean, the output, but I think it might be good and longer effect, essentially. And I think actually you have been in the, uh, at MIT, I think you were the, uh, if I remember correctly, the chair of the algorithms uh, group essentially at MIT. And you have done a great job on those things. So that I'm sure that you will be a great. Uh, right. I, I think those were uh, tasks with uh, which were more involved with coordination than um, sort of, you know, uh, the leadership roles, you know, involve deciding whom to hire. I often find that uh, uh, I can get very good advice on whom to hire from the others, but my own instinct is often not very good. So I do try to, uh, in these kinds of things, I'm happy maybe as a coordinator to lead the, these roles. Uh, leading the theory group at uh, MIT, which I did for a few years, maybe some of it was formal, some of it was informal, um, was another thing which was where you said, look, you know, the theory group could benefit from leadership and from some you know, cohesion. 
and we tried to build that in and it uh, i think it worked well i think it was very uh, successful uh, to sort of and uh, you know of course but what what's been happening at uh, mit since i left is even better so maybe it was only you know maybe i was limiting no, the yeah, i'm sure I'm, that was uh, and um, um, but on the other hand i think um, um, uh, yeah there, there's lots of ingredients that uh, that uh, that involve uh, building a good group together and the scale the, the you know helping it scale to the right sizes uh, and i think we should appreciate it there should be even mechanisms that we build into our own uh, evaluation systems to understand how much effort is going into this and uh, be able to uh, include it in the part of appreciation uh, we shouldn't be i mean one of the nice things about academia is we try to minimize judgments you know oh you are did you know good research three days back but you know two days back you were certainly not so good we don't do these kinds of things exactly. we try not to do this on a to a faculty we don't try to do this or to our graduate students we try to keep them generally you know sort of feeling positive and optimistic because that's this the 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 feeling that is very likely to uh, produce good outcomes later uh so we shouldn't be micromanaging this but at the same time you know when things are happening that uh you know enable more of this productivity i think it's good to go out sending positive feedback and reward and we should do that to all the people that we see that are doing positive things so even if you don't have the ability to do the leadership things i think you should be appreciative of it and express it and to the extent that you can i think you should uh you should try to help out because if we don't then we'll be controlled we should control ourselves or else we'll be controlled exactly that's a great and i think just one quick thing i think you already answered actually this part of the question that also that i mean like if you want to have some kind of ibr research center i think that's a thing that it has changed from bell labs to maybe ibm microsoft and now google or facebook that they have a different thing so what would be i mean like if few i mean maybe characteristics of a good research lab i mean that's i think that's an important question probably we cannot cover everything but just maybe a few things i think you mentioned that i mean the people should not be just that yesterday you have done it today you have not done it you should be fired because you have done it yesterday not good enough that's one important thing that you mentioned or uh, at the same time i mean that you can say that it's a research center this is a part of the company so you want to say the value to the leadership the higher leadership so that's also some yeah you can add something to that So, so i think i mean so i don't think there's a unique answer to what's the best way to do it as as you said you know it can be a different answer in a uh, in an industrial setting it can be a different answer in an academic setting uh, you know there are people who sort of suddenly get large uh, donations and they say oh create a center so should it look like the simons institute of theory of computing should it look like the flat iron institute should it look like the center for math sciences and applications at harvard there are many many models of or should it look like dimax there are many different models of how an uh, entity can try to operate given the kinds of funding it has and the kind of you know uh, uh, the things that would enable ensure future uh, funding i think uh, it's quite okay for uh, i i think academics and in general you know people are pretty good at defining their own research programs and working in isolation uh, a, a goal of many of these uh, organizations should be to enable a little bit more interaction cross pollination make people don't force people to work together but try to entice them to bring uh, you know come and listen to each other so interdisciplinary establishments are things that i do like and appreciate uh even and the goal of interdisciplinary interaction should not be to necessarily uh produce one product which is you know involves all of these in, uh ingredients uh it can be but it doesn't have to be but you can also i mean there's there should uh, there's already a lot of value to just learning how people uh make progress in other uh communities you know what is their definition of progress what is the definition i mean to ask you know what does a paper uh, in uh, history look like as opposed to in computer science uh, or biology etc i mean these there's very different modes of inquisition 
and even sort of uh, summarization of what you've learned uh, that come from different communities. And, you know, we learn a lot by looking at all of this. So I definitely want us to be, you know, a, a good goal of a leader of, uh, of a broad research uh, in, uh, uh, thing should be to enable more cross-pollination of ideas and somehow bring people together to just learn what the other person can do. Uh, a completely orthogonal thing, I mean, the kind of things that we've seen and things like the you know, Project Oxygen at uh, uh, MIT CSAIL and it's uh, in the uh, late uh, 90s, early 2000s and so on have been, uh, let's sort of define maybe one or a few goals, maybe, you know, I don't know if Google has a project like this around the self-driving car or some such thing where you say, okay, look, this is my ultimate goal. But let's look at everything that could possibly be related to this and explore everything and now hire a bunch of researchers, let them do it. At the end, you know, when you decide that you want to have this kind of a centralized goal, which is completely reasonable, I think it should be open, transparent, and everybody should be told, look, this is going to be our goal. If you think you fit, you're welcome to join. You should try to convince me that you fit, and then I will let you join. But from that point on, I really shouldn't have to tell you that, look, oh, but, you know, I told you that our goal was this and you are doing X, Y, Z. No, you do something else, then you're welcome to do it. Maybe our hey, Do you hear me? I think something is stopped. Uh, yeah. Hi. Do you hear me? I think this is. Uh, I don't. Yeah, so just, hello. Uh, great, yeah, point waiting and I just mentioned this. <laughs> great, bye. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, everybody for listening. I think we had a nice uh, discussion with Madhu. We actually, the computer crash, you know, this is the online things and the uh, event. <laughs> Anything can happen, but I think we try to uh, make it as, uh, I mean, nice as possible, and hopefully less events as possible. So he will join uh, soon. We were uh, talking, I think, with the several great things that Madhu has done. Uh, I mean, regarding the theory and the latest one, I think he was encouraging people who are doing research, uh, and they are stronger research to take leadership if they can, because I think that would be very useful for the uh, people. And uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, Madhu, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm there. Okay, I'm yeah, I think, uh, okay, good. And yes, okay, sorry about that. Very sorry, it was a computer crash at my end. Uh, hope you were able to. Uh... I think that's good or bad things about being a lawyer, essentially, <laughs> that anything that happens. And uh, maybe, I mean, that's actually good because it's more relaxed way of doing that. I don't know. If you want to make everything perfect, then the cost would be high. So you were talking about, I mean, the research center. And I mean, the, like, if you want to create, I think that you mentioned that we should have a goal that, uh, I mean, like, everyone say, I mean, this somehow at, at the beginning justify that why his work or her work is related to that. But after that, I mean, you don't want to just come every day, so what did you do for this particular thing? That was one important thing. You were talking about another aspect that I think it'd be, uh, you mentioned it is a bit perpendicular to this one that I think we went. Uh, uh, no, I mean, just, just that part that uh, it's completely okay for uh, industrial research centers to have uh, uh, a single objective, and I think it's very important that they do because, I mean, that some do, 
because it's very hard to create a, uh, a joint project which involves many different ingredients by just natural forces in academia. So, you know, so, so since that does not happen, uh, you have to have some organized centers, maybe industrial research, maybe even, you know, even if it's not industrial, even if it's hosted in academia, to have a targeted research uh, subculture. It should not be telling people what to do. It can incentivize people positively. Additionally, if they do the, the right things, but mostly the reward should be on its own in the sense, look, we are in this, people in this group are one of the biggest incentives to participate is that they will get to participate with others in the group. And if you create a, a valuable enough thing and you, we are all actually, any progress towards the big goal uh, will somehow con contribute positively to the goals of each of the individual players, then you know uh, the fact that you are contributing to this big goal will, uh, will be naturally incentivized for yourselves. So I think we can have very reasonable uh, mechanisms which try to you know, center around some central theme and try to bring people together and to even work on topics. And this is necessary in academia because otherwise people tend to just do their own little research. And uh, you know, it's so in this extra resources which build, bring people together uh, uh, and help them being able to do more ambitious things is definitely uh, a good idea and welcome. I, you know, nobody's giving me money and nobody should give me money to do this, but uh, 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 that would be my. I do. Yeah, I think one other point that you mentioned, I think that's very important also. I mean, just encouraging to talk. I think that's important because when I, whenever I go to industry, one of the issues is that, I mean, I don't want that, like, if I'm working on theory, I feel bad that I need to go and find the applications of my thing. I mean, I can do it at some part, but I think it would be good, some kind of incentive that other people come to me and ask me questions. That would be also great because... Otherwise, I mean, if you want to go and like generally the people who are not researcher, they have some specific tasks that they need to do that. And I don't want to go and just prop the people, oh, have you done <laughs> this? I mean, what should I do or something like this? Some kind of encouragement for them also to come and some kind of joint effort, maybe have more values in some sense. That actually would be very useful and improve the talking because if I want, if I'm the only person that I go all the time, maybe at some point I will stop because maybe I think that I, maybe I should not do that or it's not the good things to, or I'm bothering right. people only. I mean, I think, okay, put differently, I would say, yeah, there should be incentives to talk and to listen. Exactly. Uh, I, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I, as theorists, we probably should be listening quite a bit to others saying, you know, these are the kinds of questions that come up in my life so that we, you know, we can find good problems to work on and then solve them. Uh, at the same time, um, the, uh, a person who maybe, I mean, for, so, so this is a, a relationship maybe in which this person wants a service and we are providing the service, but at other times, I mean, the, even the person who's produced, you know, who's offering the service should at other times be listening saying, oh, look, here are advances that exist in the world and they should be incentivized to listen saying, find out what are the advances so that you, if there's something that's relevant to, to you, you should be able to capitalize on it. There have been cultures, I mean, I, I you know, we can always complain about how bad things are that, you know, it takes so many years for a good idea to move from the theory to the practice. And I wouldn't blame any one ingredient uh, anyone uh, participant in uh, for the delay, uh, but I think actually what's surprising to me is how effective it has been. Nevertheless, that we have been able to actually push many theoretical ideas into practice uh, over time. And indeed, if I mean actually, uh, I think I mean I'm only very familiar with sort of the Indian model of uh, research and exploration and development versus the US model. I mean, the US model is wildly successful, even though I think, you know, India has a very good uh, collection of entrepreneurs and it has a very good collection of researchers. It's just that the path in between is much, much more uh, fragile and broken. Here, it's a, it's a very rich ecosystem of continuity. That being all, that all being said, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, it would be great to have 
more of this and we definitely in uh, research and especially in mathematical style theoretical style research we have to be very uh, careful not to let our own value system and our prizes sort of influence our appreciation of works but also to constantly be connected to the rest of the world and say that look you know how how can i explain what i'm doing to the others how can i tell them why my field is exciting how can i see if i can cause an impact of my research to other places because they might exist i mean that might not be my part of my objective but it if, if that application exists, it's up to us to find it also. Yeah. Actually, we are doing exactly like that in this live. You know, that's the thing that we try to do that. And Thank you I mean, give this. that. Uh, and uh, I think great to have you again. We are uh, live. We are global. I think uh, Madhu was disconnected for a, a few minutes, but we are uh, everywhere. So you can just ask questions. I mean, uh, I mean, we have answered some questions. If you have time, we will answer. And there are lots of nice questions that we can uh, ask Madhu. So there's some limitation in the time, but <clears throat> please ask. Uh, and again, I mean, subscribe on YouTube for this one and others. You will get it. And we are anyhow live on other uh, media as well, other platform. Uh, great. So I think let's go back to the blackboard. I think you have actually a whiteboard in your house. I mentioned it. So it is not, it is not the office, it is the house. So that's like, a, let's go there, do a little bit of, I mean, uh, this type of, I mean, more uh, theoretical things. And I mean, like, not just theory, I think that's foundation things, I will call it. The theory maybe is just some kind of uh, not the best word for that foundation board. Uh, good. So I think now we want to talk a little bit about the communication. I think that's another thing that is very important, like communication, communication complexity. And again, this is uh, hugely important. I think one thing that Madhu mentioned that like we are taking the fact that the, I mean the computers work for granted, and you will put some numbers. Everyone expect that like everything the computer bring is the correct thing. But all of them actually because of these algorithms that are there that we talk about it. And also this communication that happens, all of it. And we take for granted and there are lots of errors actually happen. <clears throat> we have just seen one that the computer uh, just got frozen essentially. And this can happen for any individual things. The fact that everything works in a, such a great way and like airplanes are now based on the computers and if a little bit happen, uh, bad things happen to the airplane that, that is essentially would be a fatal crash. That's a very important one. And communication and codings are very important. Again, this is one of the main contribution, I mean, like Madhu to the field that are talking about the list decoding and I mean, uh, other things that he can talk about it, maybe the high level and go to the details. And also I, I think this is some kind of umbrella between the communication complexity and uh, other like uh, this kind of, uh, the hardness of approximation or PCP that I think he will explain more. Yeah. Great. So, so maybe I can start with uh, just the very basic problem of uh, that leads to what is called error correcting codes. I mean, you said, you know, what's the chance that, you know, computer is going to do a calculation correctly? Well, you know, even before it do, does a calculation to even store the memory, what it has stored in the memory and preserve it over time is not a trivial challenge. It, uh, uh, and if you actually look in the, you know, at the bit and the electron level, uh, things are constantly going wrong. I mean, it's not like I get to control every electron and say, this is where you should exactly stay at a given moment of time. But on when you aggregate all of this information, there's a little bit of stability, but then uh, by the time we're building this error correcting course, we're packing, I mean, by, by the time we're building our computers, we're packing so much information into small tiny chips that you would you know you, you, it should be a sort of a constant tussle there's so many electrons and that are out of control at work here and there's so much data that we are trying to extract that depend on the positions of these electrons that we are assuming are reliable how do we get to this level of reliability this sort of goes back to work of shannon and hamming from 1950s uh, and before and over time, we've been building better and better methods. We start with some information that you have, and then somehow find a way to add extra redundant information. Maybe, you know, the simplest thing you might think of is just take any information you have, some sequence of zeros and ones, and then you just repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it. That's good, but that's nowhere close to getting the right utility out of it. And the study of error correcting codes really tries to study how could I, for instance, use, if I have this much space to store, I mean, if I have this much information that I want to store and I have that much space, 
how could I best use the extra space that's available to make sure that even if some few of these electrons go out of whack and go out into orbit, I, the rest of the information, I mean, the information actually is not getting changed. It's completely uh, recoverable after time. Uh, error correcting code study this. Um, my um, involvement in this field started with some work that actually started again during my PhD thesis, but then uh, it was a question that I actually, I looked back at my thesis recently and I saw that I had actually mentioned it at a, as a concrete question. <laughs> in the, in the uh, thesis and then only solved it like five years later. Excuse me. Um, where we try to say that, look, um, when a small number of errors happen, maybe I, design, I can design codes which will correct them. When a huge number of errors happen, how much is huge? Let's take the simplest of things. Suppose 90% of the data that I've written is corrupted, okay? And 10% is good. It's what I originally wrote into this memory chip or whatever. Can you recover the original information? And almost the instinctive gut reaction is, uh, oh no, it couldn't have been recovered. Uh, so 90% of the bytes, let's say, so let's say we're talking in bytes of information. So a byte is like one of 256 possibilities. That's the number of bytes. There are eight bits of information. So some 90% of these bytes are corrupted and you want to figure out what was the original information. Clearly, you know, I could just take this information divided into 10 different chunks. And in the first chunk, leave the information that I have. In the second one, put in some other valid information that I wanted to write and use that information. In the third one, I go from the third, uh, something that I might have wanted to write and put in that information. Which of these 10 things that I wrote could have actually resulted in these uh, in this data, which has 10% right, no matter which of these information you measure it against. If I wrote the last one, well, 10% of, right, of it is right, it's the last one. If it's uh, the first one, the first 10% are right. If it's the fifth one, it's the fifth block of 10% that's right. And, and the answer is we can't really, we don't have the information to tell. And people use this as an obstacle saying that, look, you can never recover from errors when the amount of errors is overwhelming the actual amount of data. When the amount of errors is more than 50% and the amount of data is less than 50%, you cannot solve the problem. But not solving the problem is only amounting to the following thing. I cannot, I might be able to come up with a list of 10 things saying any one of these 10 things could have been written. They're equally representative of the data. And I don't know which one of these 10 it is. And the sort of the paradigm shift that happens in list decoding is we just say, oh, we accept this model as a solution concept. We say, okay, look, the number of errors was just too much. I cannot tell you which one of these was right, but the right one is one of these 10. That is all I can assure you. Well, I've changed the problem definition, but now I don't have any algorithms to solve this problem, or at least that was the way it was in the 90s when we looked at this thing. And what we came up with was for the most popular form of error correcting codes, in fact, the most popular ones on storage devices called the Reed Solomon codes, we were able to find an algorithm which was uh, which could actually recover it from say 90% errors. Okay. And uh, this came in some, first some work that I did on my own and then some work we did with Guru Swami, we were getting what's currently the best known for Reed Solomon codes we have it uh, uh, right now. And um, um, this turns out, you know, I mean, to be a, be a very, very valuable, most of the time, actually, what happens when there are natural errors is that you don't actually go, uh, none of the others even looks plausibly reasonable. I don't actually come up with a list of 10, but it actually does correct. I mean, the, the, the possibility that there are 10 things that would explain the data, each explaining 10% of it, happens exceedingly, exceedingly rarely. The possibility that I would, there are even two things which have 10% agreement is very unlikely. The fact that there's one thing happens because that's what you started with and you've made lots of errors. And we are basically in practice, what's happening is this is actually just correcting 10% errors in the usual model of error correction. The definition has been expanded to allow some, you know, worst case possibilities also be, to be tolerated. So that's roughly what list decoding was. 
Um, and, uh, sorry, so here, actually, we are using list decoding because in the encoding, we just encode it. In the decoding part is the one that, in some sense, if we cannot get the correct one, we give a list of possible things. And I assume that, I mean, in practice, we have some other measure that we can say which one of them is closer to my data that you will use it or... Right. So, so often, um, often uh, this list will be really of size one. If you really want to in, uh, guarantee that, you know, oh, this is a very important piece of data and I cannot just say, oh, usually things will be okay and so on. You can actually use a little bit of cryptography. You digitally sign the message or you do something else. And once you do all that, there's only, you can say, oh, all of these other things could have been because the number of errors is right, but actually they don't have a valid signature. So let me throw them away. Uh, so there are lots of other mechanisms which you can, and even simply measuring how much as the actual distance, very often the true data has a little bit, is a little bit closer than all the other spurious ones. They all have at least 10% correctness, but the true one is maybe 11.5% correct, whereas the other ones are just 10% and so on. So, so there's lots of measures by which we could uh, get rid of the other uh, candidates, yes. And so you are effectively down to the one correct answer that you have. And, but now we are actually correcting 90% errors. Uh, uh, great. Yeah, so that's, I think is important. I want to just add also, I mean, these things that, I mean, again, some of my experience that we talk about the computer work, but somebody say, okay, computer are working. <laughs> what about now? Uh, I can tell you actually, if you work this, for example, this Doom application or lots of others that we are doing, lots of them probably are using Kafka. Kafka is some kind of message passing essentially for the, I mean, the cloud between like your browser and the back server essentially. And, and also between the different process that you have. This is somehow is also in the based on the uh, Spark or MPC world essentially that are not message passing. And all of this message passing actually, like Google, for example, have some equivalent version, it is called Subpop. That essentially you are uh, subscription, I mean, you put some, task, you will put it on some channels and some other guys, they will take it out of that channel and do the computation for that. All of them, if you actually want to implement it or some of them that you are using it, and they are using these theories. And I mean, that was actually interesting for me because Kafka, there is one version that is open that actually has a problem. The issue that you will send the message, it might be the case that this message is not just a, like delivered to the correct person who subscribed to handle it. Or it might be the case that like, it goes to none of these guys or goes to both of these guys because generally when you send a task as a message, you want one person, one processor gets it and process it. You don't want that this goes to two of them. You don't want that this goes to none of them. You really want to go to one of them. And that's it. And this one actually to do that, lots of this, I mean, error correcting code, I, it's sim like the simplest version, of course, some of the more advanced version, if you want to get a very efficient one, is are very important to develop this one. So whenever you want to write a program, these are the ideas that are used. These are not the ideas of the past. These are the ideas that currently we are using it such that we can have such a live and in a reliable way. So that one thing I just wanted to add, I mean, from some of these uh, background things. So uh, great. So I think this, we talk about this uh, coding and essentially list coding versus, I mean, uh, this uh, like uh, and PCP. And at the same time, I think as I mentioned, there are some uh, like uh, re relation between these two because generally this is some kind of message passing because even like we talk about, I mean, uh, like, uh, uh, like one prove uh, one prove one proving uh, one prover and two verifiable for example in the PCP on this theory that we uh, that I mean that more details are there so lots of communication is going there so is this like a correct way of I mean putting uh, I mean the research of these two are very close and you had some ideas from one for the other or vice versa yeah let me let me sort of articulate what are the two areas that you're talking about and then also tell you about why they so, so there is a lot of work that has been going on in this information and coding theory communities, which is it's measuring information and trying to tell us how to preserve it, how to preserve it over time or how to preserve it over spatial communication. So I'm sending a message from here to somebody who's sitting on the West Coast or uh, et cetera. You know, when you want to send messages, you have to preserve it. And computing 
the other theory, so which goes back to Turing, is trying to tell us how to manipulate information. Again, I have a collection of bits and I want to do some processing. It represents some number of numbers. I want to sort them. I want to find out if somebody is a member of this set and so on. So for some historical reasons, we never really put them on the same page, but they really should be, right? I mean, this is the raw material and that is the grinder. So how could you not try to, I mean, how could you try to build the machine which will work on this raw material without understanding the raw material? So uh, I feel they should have always been, you know, connected much more closely than they have been. Um, but, you know, it's somehow possible to come up with clean abstractions. We never worry about errors in the computing world and manage to work. But actually, if you look at our design of chips today, design of computers today, they have error correction built in at every stage. You cannot afford to do so much computing as it's going on in a single chip. If you want to add two numbers, you want to multiply two numbers inside a chip, then you actually have to allow for some possibility that some things will go wrong. Make sure that that's not going wrong. At least put a carry, you know, one check bit associated with it to make sure that if this calculation went wrong, let's redo it again and so on. And this happens through the, uh, through the architecture of the computer. You have possibilities of errors here, possibilities of errors there, possibilities for errors there, checks for errors here, checks for errors here, checks for errors here, and then mechanisms to correct for errors in, all over the place. And these are built into uh, all of our, uh, um, uh, of this architecture of a modern day computer. It's there everywhere and it works very effectively. And that's the reason we actually trust our computers to be as reliable as they are. I mean, every, you know, I don't know how many operations my computer is performing per minute, but I can guarantee you that, you know, at least 10 of the operations that happened in the last minute were probably wrong. Yeah. And it just corrected it without even informing me or anything. It just, it's very rare that it actually crashes like it did. Uh, ten, 10 minutes ago. I mean, it happens to me once a month or so, but you know, uh, that's just because I haven't probably fixed the uh, things correctly. But yeah, it's even very, actually, very think, reliable. Yeah, and I think even uh, uh, this, I mean, <laughs> thing that we are seeing each other and all people are seeing us, I think pretty sure, I mean, lots of these packets probably may not, I mean, lots yeah. of them may be not reach actually the things, but from those that they are reaching, they reconnect like the whole thing. <laughs> Absolutely, right. So, so computing is riddled with errors, communication is riddled with errors. And in order to for a packet to reach from me to Mahmoud to you, I mean, it's already going through so many communication devices and computers that, you know, it just keeps alternating from one to the other to the other and reaches you. It's a miracle that it actually manages to do it. And it's exactly. just a miracle that we've engineered a system, which is built on so many unreliable parts, but it's so reliable at the top. Okay, so, so this is quite a phenomenon. And I think actually we don't have a great theory of it yet. We, we understand many ingredients and we understand many parts of it. Anyhow, but I think PCPs and uh, error correcting codes. Error correcting codes, we're looking at the very simple task. I've written down something and I want to know uh, if, uh, you know, after time, I have the same information. Or I want to make sure that no, no errors creep up. Uh, and if even if errors did, I'm able to correct them. PCPs are very similar, except they have an additional layer. There is some information. What is this information? This was supposed to be the proof of something. What does a PCP do to this proof? It sort of stretches it by a little bit. Again, just like in the original data, you stretched it by a little bit to allow for some errors. You stretch it for by a little bit. And now the fact that it's a proof will be overwhelmingly evident or overwhelmingly non-evident. How you manage to do this, it's non-trivial and it's tricky. And maybe, you know, since we are sort of gone for too long, I probably won't get into the details of this. But uh, yes, I mean, it is possible to do it. It uses the same principles that we started with, with error correcting codes, and then adds a lot more on top of it, which is a lot more sophisticated, a lot more complicated, but at the same time, you know, has the same level of reliability enhancement. Um, I think of error correcting codes as 
preserving the validity of data or you know think of it as you know think of your brain as storing memory we want if you want your brain to be very reliable and never forget things and so on none of our human brains are like that we would put error correcting codes everywhere and that's really what we've done in these computers now pcps what do they try to do well they try to preserve not just the data but also the reasoning you're doing on top of it so reasoning in modern in computer science language is computation you do some computation some uh, data and you want to say this is what i obtained in order to be able to convince you that if i start with this data i would end with this i need to prove it to you pcps will prove it and they will prove it with very little extra overhead on top of the work that you already did to do the computation and this is the philosophy behind the existence of a pcp it's the philosophy behind the constructions of pcps and in recent times this philosophy is turning into less of a philosophy and more of a concrete uh, application we actually in blockchains this idea of starting with some amount of data uh, adding to that data and leading to a new point of uh, you know state of the world uh, this thing needs to be proved and the proofs need to be short and succinct and easily verifiable these are preserved and they are actually using many of the pcp ideas and you know developing on it in order to be able to build a very efficient uh, yeah blockchain and should we system. talk about i mean them i mean uh, with uh, professor uh, elaine she and bill gasar so we talk a little bit about this type of thing about the applications there so the people can actually go and take a look at them i mean everything is uh, there at uh, my youtube channel Hajia guide can go there and then uh, Take a look at that, and it would be great if you subscribe for the future ones. Uh, great. So uh, I think, do you want to cover? Uh, I mean, just say any other important thing that, like in your work, I think it was some sketching again, somehow related to this in a streaming algorithm or other things that you think it would be good. And uh, and also, if maybe, what are the best references? I think for coding theory or like PCP. I think, of course, I know your lecture notes are one of the greatest things they can do it. But are there any other book? There are some simplification for PCPs. So where they can go and read it, I think that would be good. Sure, I, I think um, uh, for PCPs, I mean, um, um, <clears throat> my uh, I, I don't have concrete links at the moment, but uh, uh, one of my former students and now is a professor at uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India, Prahlad Harsha, has taught many courses on PCPs and has very detailed, very careful uh, descriptions of you know modern technology, old technology. Uh, and all the ingredients involved. So I think that's a great source and people have actually gone, read up sources, had further questions and leading to research papers recently. So I think it's definitely the, the right place. So, to uh, so, sorry, uh, uh, so what was the last name? So, uh, the, Harsha, H-A-R-S-H-A. -H -A and uh, he's uh, at the Tata Institute. Uh, yeah, so they can search and then find the Google. <laughs> that's it. We gave the algorithm, not exactly. Yeah. Uh, and what about for coding? I think the uh, coding theory. I mean, I still am very passionate to my own book that's coming out on the subject. So uh, I, I think there are there are, there are classical texts like McWilliams and Sloan and Van Lent and so on. Uh, I uh, I think one of the things that we've tried to focus on in our work, we call it essential coding theory because we think we're think, talking about only the things that are most essential in the field, is to focus one on very large uh, codes. So codes which will take very large amount of information, extend it by a little bit and then preserve the correctness of it. And on things which are associated with very fast algorithms for extend for both the encoding, the extend, extension part, and the decoding, which is to correct the errors. Um, and uh, this is what, uh, this is with uh, Guru Swami and Rudra, that we have a text uh, uh, that's currently available as a draft and, you know, a uh, few chapters are still to be added and then it will be, uh, hopefully be published. Yeah, actually, I want to say, also, this is, I think, a book that we also have it with Eric Demain and uh, Bill Gostar, this is about the, uh, I think we finalized the title, I think, uh, Computers and Interactability, a Guide to uh, Theory of Algorithmic Lorbans, or a Guide to Algorithmic Lorbans. So there, I mean, we talk about lots of hardness results for different models. I think that we will, I think hopefully, like in a few weeks, we should put it online as well. And we have this MIT Press, I mean, hopefully, like in a 
six months or so should go to the things. It is almost final. I think that would be a great thing. So we talk about uh, some of this PCP stuff, like at the high level for the people who want to just use it as engineer in some sense and use it. I think the one that you mentioned, I think there is also paper by uh, Aurora and uh, uh, Barak also, that they are going in depth, essentially. Here we try to give the thing for the general audience. I mean, like the people, they know things, but they don't want to go there and they still they use it to get hardness for several models of, I mean, things. I think that would be also another good book to look at it. And any other things about your work, I think about sketching or other things that think that would be great or the current work that you are doing now. I mean, I just say one uh, sentence or two about uh, the modern direction that I'm very interested in. I think we have very good, uh, I, I, okay, firstly, I think it's very important uh, that our work, we prove theorems and prove things, but also to model what's going on uh, as something that can be addressed by a theorem. So good mathematical modeling is very important. And this was the kind of thing that allowed, you know, Turing to say, what is a proof? And then led to the model of a computer. This is what Shannon did and said, what is errors? And came up with the notion of measure of information and measure an architecture for correcting and recovering from errors. I think these kinds of works need uh, still need to be happening. And one thing that I'm particularly very, uh, that I've written some papers on, but I'm very, you know, I'm keen to see more work on by me, by others, uh, is uh, modeling communication in a completely general setting, which would allow communication between humans to be, you know, viewed in the same mathematical umbrella as say, you know, communication between two phones which are, you know, we, we think of communication between phones as very programmed and, you know, you just tell the phones exactly what's the protocol and they execute it. Communication between humans is not like that. As we speak to each other, we develop a protocol, we figure out what could be said, what could be not said, what could it something mean. Uh, and all of this, I think, can still be studied mathematically. And the, we've done some work which, will, which attempts to do this. And I think lots more needs to be done. Uh, great. So I think that, uh, I think, and I think is there like, I think that should, I mean, cover the most important one. And of course, I mean, you can go to Madhu's page. I think there are lots of classes, uh, lots of other, uh, I mean, papers, of course, that they can go on. He has, he has done a great collection of things about getting given approximation algorithm, et cetera. But of course, we cannot talk about this. We try to give the high level. And I think that was a I mean, very nice thing. Always give the best uh, intuition, as I mentioned. So uh, I think uh, one question actually came from the audience is that, I mean, uh, how do you think about quantum computation? Do we get it essentially? Or how do you, I mean, what's your expectation? Yeah. I, I, I think the jury is still very open on it. Uh, I, uh, one thing that's happening, I mean, I used to be much more skeptical about quantum computation and its abilities, and I have become more uh, and more open to the idea that it could be doing new things, uh, but it's a could be, but not definitely not has done. And I think there are lots of, uh, and the very nice thing that has been happening in the field of quantum computing, uh, even amongst the practitioners, the people who are building computers, the technology teams, the physicists and so on, is they're paying great attention to theoretical computer science and its lessons to understand when are they actually doing something new because you know these are inherently noisy devices they're inherently error prone devices but they're also supposedly doing some things which are you know uh, different than classical machines so we haven't yet worked uh, you know completely convinced ourselves that there is something new that they're able to do reliably that a classical computer could not have done with the same amount of effort. We're certainly very far from that uh, setting, uh, but they're increasingly get, getting to the point where we are able to express that, oh, here is a task that we may be able to do, uh, which we can do better on a quantum computer. How useful this may be, it's far from the setting of classical computers where we started off and almost immediately uh, we had universal computers, which could be programmed and you could make them do whatever you want. I think our early exploration of quantum computers will be much more like the analog computation era, where we would 
build a computer for one particular calculation and that's all it will be able to do. And if we are lucky, it will be able to do it reliably and faster than any classical computer. Uh, but we are not even at that stage. But I, I have a feeling that there is a possibility that this might happen. Uh, I'm, I'm not, <coughs> I'm not making taking bets on it. I'm just saying it's. I'm allowing now for a positive probability that this is something that might happen. Yeah, I think actually that's a great point. I think that uh, this is about again communication and errors because I think the fact that actually the quantum computers they are not working now is not the case that they cannot compute it, but the error is so huge that we cannot get meaningful information out of it. <laughs> exactly this point that I mean maybe for the I mean Turing version I mean now we can use this and we take it for granted you will see that it is not that easy for quantum because there we cannot get all the information which are useful for our purpose uh, Correct. I think I think it's, yeah I think errors are uh, the fundamental uh, difference between what we are able to do with classical and what we are not able to do with quantum computers uh, but uh, that doesn't rule out the possibility that the reason these errors may be there is something fundamental and really what the classical computers could do is all we could do. I mean, I mean, think about uh, information, the way we tend to store it. We always store it as a sequence of bits, even though our model of what information is, is like, you know, a real signal. And that's like sort of, you know, in principle, I could be sort of... <coughs> You're making infinitesimally small changes, and that could mean something else. But at the end, we just say, oh, I should just store information as zeros and ones. It's not because we think that the real numbers cannot uh, be more informative. They are. It's because the real numbers are going to be damped by errors and other phenomena, so that only what survives is going to be a few bits. And so we might as well go, go for the few bits. The same kind of a realization might happen with uh, quantum computing in the quantum future. Computers. If that happens, that will not be another great contribution of theoretical computer science. Either which way, I think theoretical computer science has done a lot of uh, valuable contribution in this area. Mm, great. So, uh, and I think, I mean, like the, this one, we have this uh, section about open problem. I think you mentioned some open direction that, I mean, the way that how can we like model communication between uh, people, like the same way that is computers are uh, doing that. Is there any paper I mean, on that one? And also any uh, specific, uh, more specific, uh, I mean, problem that the people, I think, that say this is the most important thing that now it would be good that the people want to think about it. Okay, the important, very important thing. So um, I think for, uh, 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 a mode uh, of conversation as we are thinking about, I would not want to mention any specific problems because I have lots, but uh, you know they are they tend to be very, very focused on specific yeah. uh, lines of research. Mm. For the lo largest of uh, things, I mean, I think you know with errors in communication, there's always, challenges saying, can you do a little bit more and what's, where's the limit and how can you reach the limit? And we have not reached the limits, at least when it comes to, you know, when it comes to a very benign source of errors with some random nature introducing errors, we're very good at dealing with it. But when we're sending information along and there are, you know, active people maligning the information and uh, making it uh, go wrong, uh, we don't have the, uh, we don't understand the limits completely yet. So there's still questions there, but I won't go too much into it. I think um, in general, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, uh, between open questions and open exploration directions, I like the open explorations directions. I mean, I think of open questions as sort of a targeted search for I have this point that I want to reach and I know I'm going to try to find a path to it by estimating where it is. And open-ended research is I have this point and I just keep exploring the neighborhood till I find something interesting. And that's more the kind of things that I've been doing. I think uh, uh, to me, the most interesting questions and challenges have been really about human communication, why it's so different from design communication and uh, how should I do it? Um, <clears throat> and uh, how are we doing it? And you know, why, uh, you know, what are the axioms? What are the 
uh, uh, constraints and is the human solution a good solution or should, could have, there have been a better solution which we just failed to invent. Uh, so uh, this is something that I'm very curious about that I'm exploring, but I don't know that there is uh, a concrete question here that I would want to. Yeah, I think in some sense, I mean, my understanding is that, I mean, these are, if you consider humans as some kind of deep nets, essentially, <laughs> that now two deep nets in some sense try to communicate with each other. These are like the ML models in some sense. Maybe that's one way, I mean, to think about that if two ML deep models they want to communicate, is that somehow maybe the way that we are doing. But yeah. So, but are... so, so I'd say, I mean, um, there's some structural restrictions that are brought about in communication based on the structure of the brain, because what can the brain process and what can it reason with? Certainly it's an important ingredient, but there's a lot of the uh, pressure is also evolutionary because uh, I don't get to prescribe a language and say everybody should use it. Everybody, you know, we somehow socially we have to agree on uh, what the language is, and the language is constantly evolving. There are words in our vocabulary which don't mean what they started off meaning, but are being used uh, to do different things. And constantly, because of various media that are available for us to us for communication, we have sort of changed our language. And you know, often you know, when you want to text something, you suddenly find a much you know compressed form of what you used to uh, say in words. Uh, so, so lots of things, key evolutionary pressures are there on language to make it change. And if a language says, no, 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 I've published a guidebook on how the language should be used, and here's the grammar, here's the dictionary, and you're not allowed to make any changes, people will just deviate and these books will become useless rather than be useful. So uh, it's not the way at all as how design communication has been analyzed. It would be very interesting to understand what are all the pressures, what does it you know, if you, if I just, if the rest of society sort of completely changes the language and you have to catch up, how much effort do you have to put in? How hard is it to learn? What does your brain allow? Uh, et cetera. So, so, so many different things come into uh, the thing, even the structure of knowledge that we usually talk about becomes relevant. So all of these have to be modeled and understood and analyzed. And we don't think we have you know, many, many parts of this thing are missing, but the most important things that are missing, I think, are when we try to look at this as a sort of a distributed design process. I, mm -hmm. No one person can get to say, this is how the language should be. Uh, how, how how does it evolve to be good? No. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think one quick, uh, I mean, things about also this problem that might be one more technical one that somebody asked as well. I mean, so uh, this essentially about, I think, BP versus P, like when we have randomness, we believe, I think that was for a while, like it was especially like around 2000s to 2005 that I was there. That's why people believe that we should be able to see that, I mean, like these two classes are equal. Is, is this like, I think it still is open and what do you think? I mean, do we, can we solve it the next 10 years or 20 years or... Yeah, so that's a great question. I think so. So the person who we should really ask about this would be Ryan Williams, who has sort of you know dollar amounts, I think, or at least <clears throat> expect you know hierarchy of uh, complexity assumptions in in terms of when he thinks they yeah. could be solved or hardness of uh, things. Uh, BP versus P. I think we you know uh, we still seem to be very 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 far from making progress on this question uh, in a sense. On the one hand, we understand more and more and more about uh, the structure of randomness and how we can manipulate it. And so much, we are understanding so much that we are sort of wiping our problems in other spaces of mathematics. You know, we, we figured out how to do X better, we figured out how to do Y better, et cetera. But on our own core question, I think we're still, you know, making very modest, mild progress. So much so that we still don't have a way of, you know, running a randomized algorithm in strictly sub-exponential time, which is sort of yeah. the first of the question well before running it in the same time, you know, a polynomial same, time. in a polynomial time. So I think we're very far, but uh, uh, not for lack of progress. There's a lot of progress. There's a lot of advanced knowledge and understanding and we're able to do a lot better. But uh, the question might also be hard and then, uh, Maybe there will be one, um, you know, sort of a singular moment where we suddenly find one new tool, which will suddenly lead us to progress on P versus MP, P versus BBP. 
<coughs> everything that we've been seeking, but we haven't learned. <clears throat> and that moment of singularity, when it will happen, is not something that we can sort of even, yeah. where it's even reasonable to lay bets on. And what would be your conjecture on these? Are they equal? I mean, you give, there's a percentage, I think, that falls in error. Card. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I tend to be, I, it's not like very uh, uh, reasonable, uh, I mean, uh, well reasoned guesses, but I would tend to believe, uh, like with most people, that we would probably, uh, I mean, P is probably not equal to NP, and P is possibly equal to BPP. That's, that would that's be exactly. my. That's, I think, uh, that's uh, my conjecture as well as yeah so but but it's not much it's not very sophisticated uh, reasoning going into this uh, great so i think we don't want to bother you more i think that was already i think a very great things i really enjoyed that hopefully i mean the people who listen now or on the i think lots of people who listen future because we will put it everywhere again everyone can look at it i think for the uh, future and uh, enjoy that so just i think do you have any final word for the general audience or higher schoolers especially i think that they want to come to computer science i mean some interested in theory yeah yeah just one thing that i want to mention there is that i mean you know somehow I've, i over time i've met lots of people who were very uh, interested in mathematics and have been very happy to see uh, uh, you know, work on mathematical problems and, uh, you know, show an aptitude and strengths there. Um, I feel that theoretical computer science is a wonderful venue for them because A, we have rich collection of problems, problems which might actually have great impact in the future. But at the same time, there are actually, you know, there's so many questions that we see periodically. They've been resolved after so many years, but with very short proofs. And there is sort of, so there is this very nice mix of important, impactful, deep questions with the possibility of short, succinct answers. Uh, and, you know, if anybody's interested, I'm happy. I've been collecting, you know, a few short proofs also for my uh, other theoretical interest, just to see, you know, uh, why these proofs actually are considered proofs by, uh, by us. But uh, I've been collecting a collection of papers on short proofs, and they are, you know, it's quite impressive how short these are compared to how long the questions have stayed open. So it's it's wonderful to see that we live in this uh, landscape where such a thing is possible. So I would definitely welcome more interest from others. Yeah. So is there any uh, website that they can come and uh, take a look at that? It's a great idea. I should probably start to put something together. I don't have one yet. Yeah. Okay, so they can email you, I guess. Okay, if they are. Great. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that would be uh, one way. And I think, I mean, like, for example, the primary, uh, like uh, checking that number is prime is in P. I think one of these examples that the people worked a lot on that, but at the end, I think. At the end, the proof was relatively simple. Uh, I think uh, I would definitely consider it simple compared to many of the intermediate papers in that yeah. area. Uh, but some of the things that I'm thinking of are much, much, much simpler and shorter and so on. And uh, yeah, and this too, uh, uh, you know, they were considered very interesting questions. They were very open and yeah. But I think primes and P's, considering the significance of the result, it's, uh, it's such a, a surprise that it's such a short proof. Uh, exactly. So I think, yeah, so I think hopefully you will make it some, I mean, like, in your, I think you can go always to uh, Professor uh, Madhu uh, Sudan webpage. There, there's a link, I mean, there's lots of nice actually information there. I think hopefully you will add some of this on this one such that not everyone needs to email you. <laughs> they can just look at it at the homepage and see some of this and then talk with you for further. So. So if, the, I mean, I think uh, that was a great live again. I really enjoyed. If you want to say, add anything else, I think it will be happy, but otherwise we can. Spend no, it. I think uh, three hours seems like good enough time to tax anybody. So let's stop here. Yeah. That would be pretty happy. Yeah, and then of course, I mean, I uh, always, I mean, talk to the people. I mean, this is some of the things that I will also put it as a podcast. I mean, when, when I, like whenever I drive or something, I mean, that's a good thing. So we try to just essentially avoid any slide or anything. Everything should be in talk, such that the people, while they are driving or other things, they can listen to that. I think that was the whole idea. And hopefully, I mean, they can listen maybe in part. I mean, you can see some part of it and others. Because all of them actually had good information about the different topics that we discussed. Hey, thanks again for your time. And I think I really enjoyed and hopefully the people will enjoy it. And thanks very much, Mama. Thanks for doing this. I'm, I really appreciate uh, the fact that you're spending so much time on uh, uh, spreading the good uh, lessons from our field. Yeah.
yeah, thanks a lot. And then uh, thanks uh, uh, for all audience and bye for now. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.